Hello and welcome to a discussion of the Matrix rebooted by the Dunyan. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean the uh, final discussion of the Unholy Consult by R. Scott Baker. Uh, this is the final book in the series, and this is uh, going to be the last discussion for this book. We will have at least one more discussion where we talk about the atrocity tales, and we may do further discussions for. Um, what is it the appendices and some theories or whatever steve has some ideas for character deep dives that we might do uh but <laughs> all of those we will play by ear and schedule on uh whenever schedule on a basis of like whenever we are able to uh just the weekly discussions uh this is kind of the last one for it so that's <laughs> nice uh we are uh accompanied by the usual group of friends carl could you start us off with introductions yeah, I mean, and first off, I got to say kudos, Varsha. Did you come prepared with the Matrix Reloaded? That, yes. that was good. It, it, it took me a second. I was like, wait, are you just, are, are you just going random? I was like, wait, no, that's actually, that's accurate. Okay, I see you. Um, yeah, so I'm Carl, uh, first time reader, uh, and I am just so eager to discuss this. Uh, what a phenomenal ending. What a great series. Definitely in, in one of my favorite series of all time now. Uh, just all the credit to R. Scott Baker. He he really pulled it off. Yeah. Cool. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. And then I uh, read a book many times, and I'm always surprised by how thick the appendicus is. And I'm like halfway through the book, I'm like, oh shit, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Steve. It's my second time reading the series, and I'm anxious to get into it and. Lots to talk about. So a very quick question before we move on, which is just that, are the two short stories at the end of this, are those the atrocity tales? Some of them. I think one of them is published on his website. Okay, so there's more. I will make yeah. sure. There's three. There's three atrocity tales. Yeah, three. Okay, three, three atrocity tales. Good to know. Okay. Um, let's definitely name them if they are names, just so people know if they're reading along with um, us. Um, let when me we get to that. Um, I had a thread on the forum with the links to the stories. Let me uh, see. Yeah, I think Barsha posted it on yeah. that. It's the false sun, the full revelation of Sinaiel Jin and the knife of many hands. Hmm. Uh, four revelations is one of these in here. Is that something else? Uh, the false sun? No. Well, yes, that, that is in here, but appendix three in my book is four revelations. Hmm. I assume it's that one. And the third mm. one was published in a ma grimdark magazine, apparently. Yeah. Oh. But you can find it online, I think. So yeah. there are four. Mm -hmm. uh, three. These are three at first detail. Okay, I'm I, I'm increasingly confused. So there's what? false one. <laughs> I have four revelations after false one. These are two separate yeah. stories. Yeah, two different ones. Yeah, two two of the three. Okay. I thought you had a different title for the one that I called the four revelations. The four revelations of Sinaiel Jin. Uh, okay. But I guess it's the same. I, that, no, no, no. Hmm. Okay, so that's 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 the same one. For some reason, I it it my brain processed that completely incorrectly when you said that. Um, all right. Anyway, yeah. sorry y'all for that. Um, and as Varsha said, now you have another reason to join us on page two because she linked the stories there. So go check them out. Um, I guess there's also actually now that I look at the wiki, it says there's also the Karafayan, hmm. which I didn't know about. But it's in the history and story? anthology. What is, what is the history of Irwa? It's like a summary of everything. But it's kind not of... written by him. It's written by some other guy that made. But that's also something good to read because it gives you a very clear timeline of everything that happened before okay. the first books. Okay, very cool. And that is also linked on page chewing, although I'm yeah. sure you can find it if you search, but just join us on page chewing. Anyway, yeah. um, so I, I want to start off by saying that uh, talking about the spoiler that I spoiled for myself, which oh, yeah. was that yeah. the no god comes back. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I actually had that spoiled before I found out that the title of the third series that may or may not ever happen was the no god. Um, mm. and by my understanding, Varsha, you also had that spoiled for you. 
Yes, I did not get that spoiled explicitly. I guessed it by the title of the third series, because why would it be called The No God if The No God wasn't there to talk about? It can't be about how horribly they killed The No God and then we talk about it for two books. And it seems unlikely that it would be that the fear of this resurrection of The No God comes back. Yeah, so. I, 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 I don't remember when. It was fairly early on. I want to say it's mm. book one or two. So I was reading this entire series oh. expecting that it was all going to end <laughs> very poorly for all the characters. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't know exactly how or what or, you know, who was going to live and who was going to die, if anyone lived. I was fully prepared for everyone to die, I'm going to be honest, um, especially with the No God coming back. But I like, yeah. I like where we were and where we ended. Um, on the subject also of uh, l who lives and who dies, Sir was dead, right? Because I saw some people online arguing or theorizing that she's still alive. And I guess it's kind of vague, but I felt like it was pretty, like, I don't know. Personally, I, I would feel it cheapened her end if she didn't die fighting the dragon. But I, I mean, it could be like you know, like Gandalf falling down with, because it's kind of what happens, right? She falls down like the huge hole or something, doesn't he? She? There was a yeah. scene with Cayutus or a brother holding his sister's body. I assumed it oh, was Cayutus yeah. right. holding exactly. Sarah's body. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 that's why I thought it was confirmed. Like, that's why I thought, but I guess, yeah, yeah. I don't know. No, I just saw a... some she was still alive, so I don't, I don't know. There's a Baker interview I posted on the forum. You can read it now, but I believe he says that Serwa has a major has a major role to play in the next series. Oh, mm -hmm. so she is alive. I, oh, so I think she's still alive. Yeah, I mean, she was and, pretty cool in this part. Mm -hmm. No, she was, she was awesome. <laughs> I mean, I loved everything with her storyline here at the end. Uh, was phenomenal. Um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a little. Yeah. Disappointed by that, but that's that's okay. I'm bloodthirsty. That's just that's how I roll. Yeah. Yeah. Not enough people died. <laughs> yeah, not enough yeah. people died for me. <laughs> o only the entire great ordeal. If you yeah. do want to see people die properly, read Carl's book. <laughs> yeah, I, yes. I, think does, I think it does. It, it tells you a lot. If you read my book, you'll be like, oh yeah, I get it now. <laughs> like okay, <laughs> yeah, off, like a bunch of named characters, uh, major named characters. You're like, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I guess I. I just imprinted from a very young age. I think a lot of my favorite stories, just a lot of people died. Um, all that said, still great stuff, great ending. It doesn't take away from it for me. Yeah. Um, I, I was it was blown. very, that whole part was very like Eowyn versus the King of Anatsko sort of fight. There's even a part where they say something like, oh, you're not a hero or something like, or say, oh, I am a witch, you know, oh, which yeah. is like, yeah. The same from Lord of the Rings. Very well, couple no, parts yeah, yes. thought were very yeah, similar. Interesting. She like repeats that refrain twice where it's like once he's like calling her, you know, you're just like a little girl, like you're not a hero. And then at the end of it all, he finally is like, okay, you're a hero. This is like, you know, this was a real epic fight. And she's like, no, I'm not a hero. I'm a witch. Uh, yeah. She repeats it again. It's so cathartic. It's just, it, it is great. Sorry, Varsha, you were going to say something. Oh, I, I was going to complain about the dragon going after her maiden head. Not complain, <laughs> complain, but like, what an annoying dragon. I can smell your maiden head. Like, just shut up and do something else. <laughs> I know. I can't believe this. this is the series where even the dragons are perverts. It's it's crazy. Yeah. The I mean, they are creature of the arc, so I guess. No, Every it, creature it, of the yeah. arc seems to be very yeah. horny. It fits. It does unfortunately fit. Um... It, it conjures a lot of images that I really don't want in my brain, but yeah. it, it, it fits. Um, God, yeah. I don't even know. Where, where do we even start from there? Um, I have a question that can potentially kick us up. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, but it's fine. I don't think we'd have to do this one in order. Um, so are the Dunian, like the Inkoroi, made by the Ark? No. No? They just... They're just some random sect that, you know, randomly mm. survived the second apocalypse and went to, to exile and then it happened yeah. what it happened, right? My my understanding of, of kind of their, I mean, I think there is still stuff that we don't know, like necessarily the details of what exactly yeah. happened to them in the apocalypse and how they wandered to Ishual, but 
is that they would, did just follow like a Genesis, it, like his teachings about the absolute or, or whoever. I think it was a Genesis. Was it Triamis? When it, maybe there were a, a couple. Genesis? Um, but anyway, someone, you know, had a definition of the absolute and they essentially warped that definition of the absolute to create mm. their cult. It's, you know, it's kind of the classic like religious thing of like, you take these one person's teachings and then like change them around for any number of reasons, not least probably because a lot of it was spread through word of mouth and then they created their horrible cult. Yeah. Uh, what a satisfying though reveal. That was something I absolutely did not see coming at all. And <laughs> I, 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 I was like, so disappointed. I was like, why, why before the, that reveal, where I was like, yeah. you're telling me that like, the consult we built up all this time, like particularly the Inkeroy are like ch just like pathetic, like they're just pitiful. Like that's all we have. And I, and the way that it won me over was with that Dunyane reveal where I was like, oh mm. my God, the final big bag of the Dunyane, it all comes full circle. Like that, that is perfect. And then again, the, the, the parallels with the thousandfold thought and this, you know, Dunyane v. Dunyane conversation. Yeah where a credit to Baker, where his conversations can be, you know, as intense and, you know, life threatening and pulse pounding as any action scene. Um, but I thought this was even better done than the scenes with Moingus, just because it, it lacked the like, you know, I think as you mentioned, Varsha, when we were talking about the thousandfold thought that like, at least half of the conversation with Moingus is just recapping the story that we just read. And yeah. you're kind of like, okay, like, I, I get it. Like we just read this. We don't, we don't, we don't need all of this in detail again. Um, but here it was none of that. Like it was like actually talking about things and like, and yes, exposition dumping, but exposition dumping, like stuff you want to know that kind of makes sense in that moment. Cause it is this verbal sparring, yeah. going on, right. Where they're, you know, the Dunyane nut jobs are trying to woo Kellis. Yeah. Um, and it's, oh my God. And you're like every single sentence, you're like thinking about it. Wait, what are, what do they yeah. mean? What does it mean? It's right. crazy how much it goes on there and how many reveals there are and yeah. twists and turns. Like it's, it, it yeah. it's just like nonstop. Like from the moment he enters that room, it, yeah. it, it just is one twist after another. It's crazy. I guess for context, Paul, like they, it's only been the Dunyane, the like ruling the consult for the last, I don't know, maybe 15 years. I don't remember or something, but yeah, like after years. the first. Yeah, the first uh, like the Holy War, somewhere between the end of the Holy War and now, right? So they were captured, and then yeah, they had to gradually win them over. I mean, yeah. they're the Dunyane, so <clears throat> presumably it didn't take them that long. But even <laughs> so, it's gonna it, take it, a bit, I assume. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, and they we also got a fake out with the hologram, right? I mean, he just steps that was through so it. cool. That was great. I was excited oh, yeah. to see it. And then I was like, what, what is going on? That, oh, it was, that was so good. And, and Malo AB has a moment where like to your point about conversations being heart pounding, Malo AB says, this is a battle like this. There are mm -hmm. real stakes here in this conversation when Absolutely. he's listening to everything that happened. And you know what, that You've hit the nail on the head there, Carl. That that was exactly how I wanted a Dunian v. Dunian conversation to look like in the first series. To not understand most of what they were saying. Yeah. Uh, that everything to be communicated via subtext, which I feel like I have to go back and read that five times over and I still not get everything that they're talking about. But um, But the first conversation with the guy whose name starts with an M, the former, I don't know, the, the source. Yeah. The character. Yeah, Mercury. that one did a bit of a recap of I did this and you did this and the little bit of a yeah. standard confrontation, like finale confrontation between hero and villain, right? But, I, mean, I think if you don't read the appendices, well, some of the context you don't have some mm, of the information, mm. I think, right? Okay. Mm. So there's some history that not all the history actually is in the text. Some of it is in the appendices. So I, I mean, yeah, there, there's straight up some stuff where I was like, I particularly when like the most of the stuff with the non men honestly, in, in this second series in general was like, had moments where you're like, they're referencing things that must be really important, but I have no idea what they're talking yeah. about, you know, which to be fair is like true to, I mean, again, talking about the Tolkien inspiration, 
like that is very true to Tolkien, where that he just name drops things in the Lord of the Rings. And, you know, you maybe get a general gist of like, kind of, you know, who, who this person is aligned with or like, oh, they're a great hero, blah, blah, blah. But like, you don't really know, you know? Uh, and it's still really anymore. Right. Well, exactly. Just the right. same as. <laughs> exactly. That's what I mean. Is like it's like it's this like additional history that is in some ways separate from the story, but is like like behind every corner. There's like more story, you know. Um, and you know, Return of the King is another book where I remember reading it for the first time, like getting halfway through, and I'm like, "Wait, we're done? What is all the the appendix? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're telling me that we have like a hundred page appendix? That's crazy." Um, so yeah, it's. He, he wears his inspirations on his sleeve, no doubt. Baker does. For sure. I guess some of the, what were some of the revelations that were more interesting for you? Or both of you, I guess. You you start, Varsha. <laughs> that the Inkeroi are ruled by machines? Yes. Mm. That, that, that was absolutely in, in my top, top three, I would mm. say. That was... A, a crazy cool the art is the big bad big bad guy yeah i guess that but it hasn't been my mind <laughs> right it's 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 the arc is morgoth you know mm -hmm. it was the big yeah. bad of the story before the story you know it was the big bad that set yeah. this all in motion and even then there were the, the progenitors who created yeah. the arc like okay i mean i guess tied with that right is that the Incaroi are not even like the main race they were a warrior race created Hmm. by the like the big tech guys yeah that was crazy uh like it really was just like like this series it again it's like wearing its in influence on its, its sleeves like that's that's alien you know like that that's kind of, i mean yeah. i guess there's still things about xenomorph's origins that are up in the air but like you know that they're, they're they're like genetically engineered to be like the worst and <laughs> it's it's awesome it's great Pretty much, I guess. Yeah, we and we get that they got damned by the gods because yeah, they to renounce them. I guess they try to know everything, and that's why their whole race got damned. But yeah, and also, I don't know if it's mentioned. I think it's mentioned here that like their world didn't have magic. Like this is, I think this they say something like this. This is the first world they mm. got that has magic. So there's something special about Erwa. Interesting. Mm. Did they say that in the book? I might have missed it. I think it's or is it in the or appendix? It's implied. Okay. Yeah, I didn't catch like, that. Yeah, I think they brought the like the magic, the the destroying magic technology sort of the core sort of thing. But I think they brought it. Mm. Or, uh, Got I don't it. think it existed before. Hmm. I thought I think their world, I think it says, oh, maybe they say something like the, the progenitor's world was an anarchine world, just like we called up Atrital, which was anarchine, mm. where magic doesn't work. Yeah. I thought the Korai, though, were explicitly created by people. Like, yeah, but I thought that, that, that technology, like that technique was brought okay. by the Inkoroi. I think they was like they taught by the Inkoroi, I think. But I don't quote me on that. Okay. You can look it up. Interesting. <laughs> There's still a lot of uh, uh, of stuff. You know, that's that's one of the remaining mysteries, right? Is it, what exactly are the core, the tears of God? Like, how does that work? Yeah. You know, mm. what what sort of... If you check, I think the interview that I posted has Baker responding to some of that. Interesting. But it's not completely clear. There are some interviews where he does. I, I might link a forum there's a forum post where a guy collected all the actually responses of baker on all mm. these questions uh and you can just go through it it's like long but give me, <laughs> give me now <laughs> yeah oh i'm ready to read it yeah oh now coyote was the no god Coyote was no god now, oh what a great again look, I, it's crazy I, I i had forgotten about that one and that was another one that like had my jaw on the floor it's like it, this thing was just non-stop yeah Oh my god, that was so cool. So all the yes. flashback that we saw about him marching through is them being, you know, brought to the sarcophagus to try one after the other to see which one would work. It's mm. crazy. We've just gradually mm. seen his storyline over the, the, the whole series. And yeah, just found out how it ended. That is, that is wild. And it's interesting that 
I think wasn't Nelka Yuki that had he had a brother. He had a uh I don't know if he was like a oh, I'm trying to remember what's the term for a brother that's a clone of you. Because like oh uh, like a twin? A twin, yeah. I, he had a twin, right? Yes. I don't remember if he was stillborn or not, but there's definitely a parallel with him and being, having it you know, right, a twin in Kilmomus, and then both being an a Trimber, right? Wait, yeah. so also it just occurred to me. So I guess Kilmomus really is just Sammy in his head. Mm. It seems like it was. Because a joke Actually, was careless, right? right? Yeah. But Which I, I, I was both surprised and not surprised. It was so gratifying to be like, okay, clearly that was a joke in the vision. A joke we yeah. did have plans for Kellis. What I did not see coming was a joke Glee was one of the heads, one of the decapitants on Kellis's belt. That was crazy. Uh, oh and yeah. Then, and then and then he's in Nair too. It took me a while yeah. to understand what the fuck was going on there, but I guess he'd been there the entire time too. I um, maybe he just inhabits him at the end when he dies, because I think it's implied that souls that die that, that are strong enough can become like demons or gods uh, in the afterlife. So maybe he sort of got, you know, inhabited by a joke and they merged into, because it's also implied that demons are not just like, or gods are just not one entity. There's like a mix of souls. Because okay. we saw when there was the demon, the vile angel that went into, you know, at the beginning of a fight, that when he sort of disappeared, he kind of burst into a bunch of different entities. So mm. I think it's sort of implied that demons are like a conglomerate of many souls with maybe one soul kind of wrangling them together or something. I don't know. It's it's something to do with that. It's not super clear, but okay. Then I... our sorry, go ahead, God. No, you 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 say what you're gonna say. Oh, I was saying then does that explain Kelmomus and Samarmus then? Uh that they were a demon in some form because they're basically <laughs> one soul and it was difficult to separate them that's interesting i i guess in some ways that's also the kind of precursor the foreshadowing for the idea that you can have multiple souls inhabiting a, a body mm. which cool i yeah I, I hadn't fully registered um i a lot of the stuff around the possession i was sort of confused by and i i think i pieced out most of it by the end but like there were still things like you know how long had Kellis been possessed? Like the gods see in four, di you know, dimensions. So like, are they, yeah. has Kellis in some ways always been possessed? Was it the moment where he was on the circumfix that well, did so it? It seems to be the moment, right? But like at the same time with the gods, you would think if they exist in like okay. four dimensions that it in well, some he's ways- he's not possessed. He's, Kellis is Kellis and Jokely is on the outside. The only reason when he gets Golgotra though, it's so thin the between the inside and the outside that he can emerge through Kellus and actually go into the real world and affect things in the real world. Just like we saw the other demon, right? That when he went into Golgotra that suddenly he could That, that said, Kellus definitely did go to the outside and yes. commune with the joke league. Yes. And but it's not clear if years. Kellos, like he made a deal with Ajokli, right? But it's not clear if Ajokli was playing him or if Kellos, like what was going to happen after Ajokli possesses him and then takes control of things. Where we got a split power, was Kellos going to go to the outside and Ajokli switch with him in the inside? Like it's not clear exactly. Right. I mean, because we know, don't who's playing who. I, I do feel like Ajokli was ultimately playing him. At the same time, Kellos yeah. is the type of person, he probably had contingencies in place. Like a part of me wonders if even now he has contingencies in place. I mean, he's uh, like dead, that was but... that I wondered. <laughs> no, right? But like he could have a head somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, exactly. maybe. Like uh, that was a theory. I, I, I had just wondered if he had contingencies. If he had thought, what happens if the no god wins? Um, and then I saw someone online post a theory of like, well, what if, you know, he has the heads. Like, what if he has stored his soul, a part of his soul somewhere? You know. Yes. Uh, or like has prepared something for that um so Possibly. i think you know i think that that is a possibility um all the possession stuff is murky and it's not yeah. it doesn't need to be explained i like my magic to be mysterious um <laughs> but it, it is 
yeah, I'm, I'm unclear exactly on, yeah, what some of that is. It, it does, though, however, make it seem like Kellis wasn't lying when he said he was going to save everyone's souls. To my mind, I think he, his deal was that he was going to literally, as he says, conquer hell and essentially make it so that they're not tortured for eternity. Oh, really? I thought he was going to rule hell and he's going to take everything for himself. Like he's going to become like a big, a big god, pretty much. And instead of the other gods taking the soul, he's yeah. going to take them for himself. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that was part of it. I think his idea was he was going to yeah. serve hell and then just like actually save people's souls. Maybe. Well, we don't know what he was going to do, I guess. But. Yeah, and we don't know for certain. Um, that, that was just, I guess, me connecting what he had been yeah. telling everyone versus what. And part of the reason I say that is because I feel like a lot of the times Kellis lies with the truth. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I feel like that there maybe was some truth to that. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean it would be a good experience because it's still hell, you know, like that would still suck <laughs> to be there, even if you're not getting tortured, right? Like, I'm pretty sure it's like on fire, at least one I, of the hell is on fire. So. I don't think everyone is, though, like being tortured. I think some people are, I think. Some of them are just like partying day and night with the demons. I and think stuff, right? so. I, I was joking. I think I read somewhere, but. If, if that's true, that's awesome. I love it. If, if you're just like evil enough, they just let you party with them. Nair for sure is going to like cause some shit in hell. Yeah. That's, I think a, that's a storyline I will say I was incre- I, I Actually, that that's the one aspect I was underwhelmed by. I almost wish Nair just died in a thousand fold thought. I, hmm. I was grateful for his interactions with Moingus, but I feel like he did not do enough. Like the, the most interesting part of him coming back to me was other than his interaction with Moingus was that he we got to learn a little more about the possession and to confirm that the gods are blind to the no god yeah through him uh but i just like i don't know i i felt like he didn't do anything of no in the probably whole. the next book if there is he would probably do something i would think i guess if he comes back again i thought he was dead for sure well maybe he becomes like a zombie inhabited by a joker or something who knows right. he just yeah, like he got his like skin ripped off and shit you know yeah like, I felt like he was pretty like for once like it wasn't like fade to black it was like we saw him slowly die or maybe we see mm-hmm. we see nayer in the afterlife that's the plot line mm-hmm. that that would be interesting it would be cool to go to the outside and in, in the next we i almost feel go, like we did go in the outside we, somewhat uh, that's true. Yeah, we did. We have. We've, we've certainly been on the borders. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess that I would recommend trying to search for some discussions on the head of a poll now that you and okay. try to that, understand what people say online, because I don't fully understand. That's what I was going to ask is what the hell is the deal with the head on the poll? That was the other. I was like sitting like at thinking afterwards, I was like going to bed. I was like, <laughs> I still don't know what the hell that is. I thought that there would be a payoff, but I, I have a no lot of that. speculation on what it actually means but i i guess for actually this is some shit. we have to wait until the no god i'm sorry baker come on yeah like i mean for the story you can just say okay that's how he goes to the afterlife and all those sequences are him talking with demons and making deals with a joke with pretty much right it's him being there and seeing what happens how it works then what? a lot of people speculate on that well, how are we supposed to interpret that a, a head on a is kellis the head on the pole is he seen? Maybe. Head on, I, some, I think some people say like he puts his own head on the pole and he switches with someone else's head so the demons cannot take his soul or something like that. Or he, some people say that he looks into the head so he doesn't actually look at the demons. He looks through the head to see what's in the afterlife. I don't know. It's hmm. very confusing. I don't know, Steve, if you've read something more clear than that. But No, I first have heard of that one. <laughs> okay. That's wild. We'll have to look up. To, yeah. We'll have to try and figure that out. I, and I think I, there's someone that connected. Like, okay, well, these people died at this part in the history. There's some like uh, generals of Kellos that died at some part in the history, and that correlates when he goes to the outside and when the kid, the captains appear or something. So he was. So some people are connecting. All oh, these, the captains, are these people that died. Mm. Uh, but it's not. Are their heads put on the, a pole? It seems like it's some way of him going into the outside without being possessed, right? Why do we have the point of view too of the head on the pole, and it's so atemporal? Like that. This is what I'm struggling with. Like I assumed it had to be a god. Like we had to be seeing a god's vision because that's the only reason it should be written like that. Otherwise, it's just like 
Like, well, like there's no time in outside. So. By the end, is like yeah. if he exists like that too. Like I don't know if he was supposed to be like he. Yeah, like one of the things that I I, I stumbled across some people uh, mm -hmm. over time just like theorizing, like throughout the reading about the idea of like ascending and the yeah. idea that you could like get more power, which is like you know that's like a concept in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. I don't know that I believe that that is a thing. Mm. I I I I don't know that you can actually. Like, I think beings kind of just are, and like the gods are just like more powerful sea frame who like feed on other things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think that Kellis, for example, because all the theories come down to Kellis, like could ascend to become a higher level being. I, I don't think that's possible. Okay. I, I think he's like always trapped as a mortal, just able to like. I mean, that's just my reading of it. It's like, obviously, there's some weirdness to what you can do with a soul. But I don't know that, like, there's such a thing as, like, I just feel like there's not evidence in this universe that you can grow beyond yourself, if that makes any sense. I think maybe his idea was, like, if he goes through Golgotra, which is somewhere which is blind to the gods, then he can actually break this sort of circle of the gods predicting everything and everything already decided for him. Right, so that's where he can actually have some sort of agency. Hmm. That's my right. thought, but I don't know. No, no, I, I mean, that makes his plan actually makes sense to me. Like weirdly, after seeing it all, I was I was worried that it was going to seem like nonsense, but I actually followed the logic through it all, including to how, what I thought was conquering hell to save the souls of the people who yeah. were there. there. Um, like it, it all makes sense, especially knowing that like the gods don't see the no god, and mm -hmm. so you know, which again cut, makes sense with what the hell is going on with Kelmomis. Yeah, Darshan was predicting it last time. So, I I'm not sure anymore that that's why they can't see him, right? Like unless what that's is why. it pre-written that he's going to be the no god, and that's why they couldn't yes. see him. hundred percent. Because yeah, yeah, because it's not linear, so something. If you if he was the no god in the future, he always was the no god. Yes. So it means they can mm. never see him, right? Because we already assessed that with the white black warrior, that time is not linear. Like the gods already see everything in the future. Everything is already sort of happened. It's there's some weird consistency there, right? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I was wondering if the reason they couldn't see him and that's why it made him conducive to be the no god was that he's two souls in one and Kel Kelis said that he flip-flops between the two so maybe the gods don't sort of latch on or they're unable to latch on to either one assuming that the souls are the unit that the gods yeah. see when they look at the world but it could be actually i haven't thought about that but couldn't a jokely see him though no Kelis, could, no. yeah that's what that's why he managed to surprise that, like that's how Kellis died basically. Yeah. What was he surprised Kellis slash a joke lead because the yeah. joke didn't see him. He was like, I also, he really, I, I didn't get this at first, but I think he's literally standing like right in front of a joke lead. Yeah. And the joke mm -hmm. lead didn't see him. And then Kellis finally like got control again and was like, Kelmomis, what's, and then what he got are you started. doing here? I... Yeah, he sort of, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but you can also see it in the previous books with the Narindar when he's spying on the Narindar. He says stuff like, oh, he sees when there's people, he's sort of like, oh, he hides and he's some sort of possessed by something. When people are gone, he sees him become like a normal person, kind of. So it's like, what's going on with that? But he's the only one that sees that because oh, the no god acting floor joke really doesn't, or not in the no god of future. Or they, uh, you know, the gods through the Narendra don't see him. Mm. Right? So we're at a point now where we know for a fact that we don't know what the no god is. Like, this isn't something <laughs> so... that's going to. So I, I want, I, I'm curious what you guys think the no-god is. The theory that I've read that makes the most sense to me is that the no-god, because it says it collapses the subject and object and achieves the absolute. So what I've heard that makes sense, <laughs> a lot of preambles, <laughs> is that he's like a super advanced computer that that's why there's only 144,000 souls. It's because that's the limit that he can compute to calculate everything that happens to these souls. So he can see why they do everything. So he can achieve the absolute and this way break from a cycle of the outside. 
because hmm. he's calculating, he's predicting everything that's going to happen to be souls. And if it's more than that, he can deal with it. So he needs to get to that number. And then, because it says something about code, they say something about code in the actual book inside the no goal. So I think it's something to do with that. 75% of that makes sense to me. The, the 25% that doesn't is how does that cut the world off from the outside? Like he just does, like he can just do that if he can calculate everything. Because I think it breaks the cycle of like the absolute, because then the no God can affect things outside the what's, I guess, predicted and seen by the gods. So these souls are not bound by, because if every soul becomes sort of like bound to the no God or like, I don't know, predict by the no God within the no God influence, then suddenly the gods cannot see them, perceive them anymore. That, that, that again, almost makes sense to me. You're, you're filling in some of the holes, but to me, then the big hole in that is that wizards or, or sorcerers automatically go to hell. It's not the gods who decide that they just do. Yeah. Um, you know, the gods couldn't save them if they wanted to, like they just, they just go to hell. And so yeah. the no God wouldn't change that. You know what I mean? Well, like, well so they it wouldn't be cutting them off from the outside. They wouldn't die though. I don't think anyone would die in this 144,000 souls war. I think everyone would just live forever. Oh, you say people live, live forever. I think oh. so, because then new people wouldn't be born. I th I think that's the idea. I'm not sure though. Because there there is there is talk about cheating damnation and cheating death, right? So maybe they Those could. Those are two different things, though. But given that the character survives so much, so long, I assume that was their plan. Mm -hmm. That's what I assume, but I don't think actually it's mentioned. Because otherwise, numbers would always go down if there's no more births. Unless they they only allowed births is like oh you have one person one dive and one one birth. But yeah, that, I mean the, the 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 computer calculation thing there that makes a lot of sense. If like that's for whatever reason the upper limit of what the no god can calculate. All that said, also though, wasn't the no god discovered? On the planet, no god wasn't brought with the no god was with the ark, it was brought by the ark. It's, I think, it's like implied it's some sort of like embodiment of the ark at this point. I, I, for some reason, I thought they said they found the no, they discovered the no god on. I whatever. think because by the time they got here, they probably had forgotten so much of the technology of progenitors that they were kind of rediscovering the technology within the ark. They were not in because I think it says like they say in the discussion, the in Koroi, when they crash landed here, they were not in control of the Ark. They were slaves of the Ark. And then only like the first, I don't remember the guy, Seawall, like he was the first one to rest control, like to actually be, okay, I'm in charge here. I'm going to make things happen. Right. Okay. So I think just like the console, like they discovered like how to make skin spies and other things that they didn't, they in Koroi didn't know before. So I think the they were discovering, yeah. yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. That's a plausible theory. Um, I think the council also says something like, oh, why didn't, you know, Kellos says, why didn't you nuke everyone? And they say oh, like, yeah. oh, well, we only managed to make one work and we don't know if they're obvious or. Right. No, that that's true. That's true. That makes sense. Um, interesting. Okay. But why is it a whirlwind? Because death came swirling down. It's true. <laughs> There you go. And, and sometimes death came spiraling down instead of swirling down. <laughs> Did they change it? I didn't even notice that. Yeah, a couple of times. Interesting. I like like I, I, I can kind of see the like symbolic purpose of it, but I just ha struggle to understand why it would need to be a whirlwind. Like why that would be part of its function. Like I feel like there's a lot of things like you could shoot lasers, you know, like what why a whirlwind? Um Maybe to protect itself? I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess I guess maybe that makes sense. Um, I don't know if that's inherently the most protective way, but like maybe, you know, maybe that's just what they had. Like maybe maybe that was the best protection they could do. Um, yeah. What I'm not sure is like I guess why did the no god come out looking as Kellis first? And then be like, psych, I'm the no god. Um, so I had no idea what the hell was going on there. Yeah, that okay. I completely didn't okay. understand. Um, something I read online 
that made some sense to me was that was mm-hmm. a hologram uh, doing salt. Um, that makes sense. To trick people to be calm while they were launching the no god. Uh, that makes sense. But it was pretty uh, cool when Mima is like, like watching and it's like that movie. I don't remember what movie is that where people look normal and then there's one guy with glasses that sees that they're actual aliens or something. Oh. It's kind of like that. Yes, absolutely. I, my, a thing that still doesn't make sense to me though, is why is it, why, why is the, what do you see? Like, why, why are those lines what pass through history if it's not Kellis saying it? Like, to me, it made sense if it was Kellis, but if it's Kelmomis, who is the no God, then why is it these lines that fake Kellis said that's going through history? I think it gets, I don't know. I think it's just the no God. It's something about the no God. Which so I guess that's still just look part it of it, and they they like warped what the no god was saying to sound. It just that, yeah. that I feel like the pieces don't okay. fit together yet. There for that yet. I at first was like, holy shit, Kellis is the no god, no. and it was like it, it it was like it suddenly all makes sense. Like I see how that tracks through history, and then it was revealed that it, it wasn't him. He was dead, and Kelmomus was the no god. And I was like, well, how does the what do you see make any sense then? Like it would have to me made so much sense. It was like this entire time it was him talking to me, Mara, and that was echoing across time. That was about to like to that my jo- that that was maybe like the number mm. one where my jaw was on the absolute fucking floor. And then it guess it wasn't that. And I, mm. I don't understand now what any of that means. I think it's but, some the no god you can find people like but it's got something to do with him being the I guess the absolute or like collapsing the subject of or an object, which I still don't understand what it means. But it's something that's repeated a lot, like subject and object and desire and something else. Like that's what the Genesis says. Genesis says desire and subject, maybe, or something like that. Like the outside is the realm of desire and the inside here is the realm of reality. So that's where reality here grounds things outside is governed by desire, so will. But then something about the no god no, collapses thing in ways that I don't understand. Is it is it just like I think it's got something like he can't see himself. He doesn't know what he is, what it is. Right. It, so is it like well I, I guess what I'm wondering then is it is it so it is the no god saying that. But is it like almost like a program like question of like, because it's all about like meaning. And I guess I I see Baker say this series is about like the death of meaning and the idea that like it's challenging you, right? Like what is your, what is it that you see, you know? Um, Like when you look at me, what am I? What do you see? Uh, And and so, you know, essentially what is the meaning of me? What is, what Mm. what am I? Um, But... I guess we don't, the mystery then is still like, why, like what, Yeah. what is the purpose? Like, is that programmed into it? Is it, is that it literally asking like the person, like in, in that kind of the way that I, you know, I initially interpreted it as like this sort of senile, like it's not senile, but it's like trying to understand itself, you know? Um, but it was something to do with that, but it's not, <laughs> I'm not smart enough to understand. So, is it uh, like, we know that now Kayuti was shoved into the sarcophagus and made into the no god, and same with yeah. Kelmomus. So, the what a darkly hilarious scene, by the way. <laughs> that they're not not now Kayuti. I'm sorry, but Kelmomus when yeah, he's Kel-Momis. shoved in, yes. he's kicking and screaming like, like, dude, what did you think was gonna happen? <laughs> like, I'm sorry, you're, you're like big dumbass moment there, like. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, I have no sympathy for Kel Momus, but with yeah. now Coyote, it was mm-hmm. it, yeah. it felt like he's regaining consciousness, but he's realizing that he's not what he is, and so all of the no gods questions made sense again, like the lack of place or whatever that mm-hmm. the senility that uh, Carl was noticing that made sense, but less like so. You, oh, interesting. But less so in the case of Kelmomus, though. Like, why? And Mm. it all... I mean, I like that it's nice as a literary device to repeat the exact same questions, but it makes less sense in the case of Kelmomus than... Exactly. That's what's breaking it for me, is that, like, like what you're... What you just, you know, put forth for 
now KUD also makes sense, right? Is that he's been so tor like tortured, so ravaged and his spirit so broken that like in this form, he's like, what am I? You know what, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's struggling with that. But Kelmomis, that doesn't make as much sense because Kelmomis hasn't gone through that journey that he went through. In my mind, though, like the souls that go into the no god, they're like kind of consumed by it. I don't think in my mind, there's nothing left of them. It's like a, I don't know, fuel or something. It's, it takes them over. I don't mm. think it's them saying the things. It's like the no god, which is a separate entity I, in some I way. I kind of want Kelmomis to be alive in there <laughs> somewhere. Uh... I don't know. I don't know where the third series will go, but I have a feeling Esmanet will have a mothering role to play in in the No mm. Gods future. I was so <laughs> happy to see that she survived. I really thought Esmanet was doomed. I I was like convinced that she was gonna die. I was like, there's no way she makes it out of this, but she she really did. And Mimara too. And yeah. Mimara is now like Jesus Christ, I guess. But we didn't really see where that's going, so I I don't know. Um, that's interesting. I oh. did see another theory that this whole thing is leading to them succeeding, the no god succeeding, cutting everything off from the outside, and then uh, Mimara essentially doing like a New Testament and starting like a whole new like reality for the world, um, and essentially like redeeming humanity. Um, mm. Maybe, yeah. but I I don't know exactly how all those pieces. There were a lot of missing pieces in that theory, so I don't know where that would go exactly, but. Um, you know, creating new meaning from a meaningless universe where like you had mm -hmm. essentially the gods starved, right? Because they got separate, cut off from everything. And then so there are no gods, there are no like Sifrang feeding on people. And so now it's like creating a new, or at the very least, there are no gods feeding on people. And now there's like a new chance, like a new, a, a rebirth in a sense. Uh, yeah. For humanity and for all lives. Um, yeah. We did, it's interesting you say, though, the question of, like, is Kelmomus alive in there, right? Because we don't know what happens. Yeah. Like, I feel like it is similar to what you're saying, Dan, where where it's like, it's like the gods consuming souls. It seems like probably that's what the no god does to its corporeal inhabitants, like, soul. Is it like, it like the Amiolas, maybe it's like there's two souls. It's like right. sort of fusing of the souls, maybe. And, and, and what I'm getting at is like, we don't know what happens to those souls that get consumed. Like, yeah. surely they don't cease to exist. You know, if you think of like, you know, using the, the wheat, you know, that gets chaffed and, you know, made yeah. into bread or whatever and eaten, right? Like we shit that out. Like, so what do gods do with the souls, right? Is it just sitting in their stomachs, their cosmic stomachs? Like what, what's going on? Know. You know, I'm going to so link you a whole, there was a whole post on a forum that was, I don't know how long ago, it was very long about why. <laughs> doing his theories on what souls are and like arriving at some conclusions that like souls are like, I think divided in three parts or two parts, like there's the mortal soul in the outside and then it gets imprinted so, like some sort of a ledger when it passes through the real world. So it all starts with the God of God. So it's all like one single soul and then it separates from it. It goes from it inside it gets marked and that mark differentiates it from the God of God. So it cannot go back. And that way it gets sort of, it merges back into other demons. It was like a long and interesting post, but. Interesting. Yeah. It was a lot of speculation, obviously, but it, <laughs> it made, it made some, it was kind of interesting thinking about it that way. Cause there's a lot, a lot of the things that you read about people speculating on this. It's like, they have no proof, but it's interesting to think about. Right. You know, think about following that logic and see, okay, they see that and see what ends up. Just like, okay, well, if a no god is some sort of self moving soul that can predict everything that comes before it, so it's not influenced by anything else, so it's no the simplest, what would that be? Like, is that what does that imply? Is that why he says, What do you see? Because he can't see him. It's, I, I don't know, like, I'm trying to think what what that would mean if it, everything all your emotions all your thoughts you know where they come from the the, the problem there is that, again that that is an inherent paradox where that would freeze you theoretically you would not have yeah. any drive to do anything which i was so satisfied going to theories that my fucking theory from book one that baker <laughs> was smart enough to be aware of the paradox in dunyan's yeah. philosophy that their pursuit of something was still driven by a darkness that comes before which kellis explicitly says here yeah 
that you are not separated from it. You're just not aware of what your own, what the darkness is that drives you. Yes. Right? And that you are still yourself uh, a that slave. It's literally impossible to know everything. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, and it's the same thing with the no God. Like, how would that, like, it still has its programming if, it, if we're going off it being a computer, right? That is making it do these things. And so it, it, even in that way, it is still a slave. So darkness but that comes I forth. guess technically a computer could understand its own programming, right? And just keep doing it, I guess. Yeah, I guess. It, 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 it would be somewhat a self-moving soul if it also knows all the inputs that go into it, I guess. If it can predict all these souls and everything that's happening, I guess. If it's powerful No, I, I don't think it is, though. I, I, I don't think it is. I, it, 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 if it continues to just act on that, like how do you, how do you define that free will? Like, even if it's aware of why it's doing the things, it's still doing it. Well, it's basically. not free will, though. I don't know if it's free will, though. That's that's how that's what the Dunyain were saying. But I don't know if that's reaching the absolute right? means you have free will. Maybe it just means you understand what you are. As in a computer program, understand what it is, because it, it is exactly what it is. Okay. That, that, Maybe. I don't that know. That I can get on board with. But that's a different definition of absolute. Yeah. And it's definitely not a self-moving soul, which I feel like by its definition, it's self-moving, right? It moves itself. Well, and a computer program can technically move itself by following its own program, uh, in a sense. Yeah, but that's then, what... Then we yeah. all have free will, right? Like, Kellis has free will. We all... Mimora, every, all the characters have free will because they make the decisions to do the things. But you they're know? all influenced by what came before and the, the gods and everything. No god would be as well. You see what I'm saying? Like, like it still has its program. It's still acting on that. Even yeah. if it's aware of where its programming came from and all of its, why it is doing the things it's doing, it's still doing those things, you know? Like, and, and, yeah. I, and I think that that is in some ways the paradox of like the argument around free will is it's like, even if you are actively influenced by things you cannot comprehend, you're still making decisions in the moment. So even if those are the decisions you're always going to make, you're making those decisions. So like, is that free will? Is it not? I guess it depends on like how you define it, right? Yeah, but I guess we are not in control. Technical or program could be in control, but just I don't know. I'm translating, but they, that's what they say. I guess the Dunsol say that the progenitors achieve absolute through technology, right? No, they or tried. We're close. Yeah, yes. we're very, very close to achieving absolute. Fruit. That's what they say. The closest anyone has ever gotten, which yeah makes sense, but where they failed was that they didn't understand like you know the the functions of like the soul you know and, and yeah like, yeah that's what they're missing thought, yeah right and i guess the the no god is supposed to bridge that gap but even then again if it continues to do the thing like i almost feel i i don't even i, I don't know what would happen you know like i feel like yeah. it would cease if it like understands everything that it would just yeah. like cease like it would exist but it wouldn't I anything. guess if they're just missing the soul, there must be something, I guess the way the soul is linked in Urwa, because the soul is something from the outside and something to do with magic and, right, because this is the only world that, where magic works, which means there's something different about the souls here that can act on reality. So I think that must be like some part right. of why the no god might be able to work here. I don't know how, but I'm sure it must be. No, Maybe I mean, it's right, just right. like that it's much thinner, the distance between outside and inside in Urwa, and that's why souls can do that. Maybe I don't know. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. If that that but, is yeah, yeah. the border is thinner, so that there it's somehow easier to like bend yeah. the world because. I wonder if that maybe Earth. that implies that Urwa is like a topos of some kind, the whole planet, right? Yeah. It. It's interesting too because it, it veers very much into sort of that classic like Abrahamic theology idea that like Earth is the center of the universe. Yeah. Uh, and in this way it is unique in some seeming way, but it's unclear exactly how or what, what the ramifications of that are. Yeah. Maybe it's created. Maybe the Inkoroi were also coming from space somewhere else much, much earlier. Who knows? I mean, one thing that is somewhat interesting to me is if you look at the map of Urwa, right? I don't know if you want to look at it now, but if you look at where the Golgotrap is, you can see a big circle, right? 
And you kind of, if you look around, you can see a lot of other formations. We kind of look like circles a bit in a similar way to Golgotha. So is, does that mean there's other impact craters of things coming from the sky? I don't know. Like even the islands where the, uh, the um, uh, what's it called? Mandate is from. It's like pretty similar shape to, you know, Golgotha and the plains, and even like all the mountains around the Nansur Empire and stuff like there's a lot of like sort of cyclical like structures kind of. So I'm just wondering. That is interesting. Yeah. Because that could be why there's multiple. And uh, even uh, along the mountains, there's some areas that look a bit circular to me, but. On a I sort of similar note, I, I know Baker said that in a theoretical third series, we would go to Iana. Which I'm excited mm, okay. by, by the idea of. Got, I mean, I don't want to spend this whole time talking about what could come next. I, I know Varsha also said it's like she was eager to discuss, you know, the ideas of of, of what what could be beyond um, this series. But we do have a lot of other stuff still to talk about. My gosh. Yeah. Um. I did have a few things like uh, some of the things you guys were talking about. Yeah. I I agree that the programming would be the computer program's darkness that comes before, right? And isn't that essentially the point he is making about humans, that there is some programming that right. we just rely on to make decisions? And in the case of computer programs, at least it is very deterministic, unless you're talking AI with probabilities and stuff. Maybe the no god is an AI model, who knows? But, um, but there was another thing that I thought of about mm -hmm. the what am I questions right the uh i guess the disorientation of the no god you remember when uh mm -hmm. there was some non-man thing where they go to the extent of destroying memories and mm. we talked briefly about how that brings them closer to the afterlife. like that's a bit like the dunian in that they are even remember removing their own identity as the part of the darkness that comes before so do you think the no god is created with no sense of identity or at least it it knows enough to be aware to be self-aware but mm. not actually have a sense or memory of its own identity and that's why it's starting with these questions about <laughs> what the heck am i where am i and what do you see maybe mm. That is a really interesting idea and actually mm -hmm. kind of ties into something that I, I was wondering as as Dan and I were going back and forth earlier about the idea of like, okay, if the no god with its 144,000 at that point becomes like a self moving soul, if what that means is then it does become fully aware and goes against its programming. And so it is supposed to do all these things maybe and maybe at that point it, it does just cut off the outside world or whatever but then it essentially acts as a sort of god and like rewrites you know it, it goes beyond what it was originally intended to do i guess is what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. um and I, and I don't know if that would be a good or bad thing <laughs> but yeah. like you know the idea that it would in some ways like rewrite the laws of the universe and you know move maybe. beyond what it was right where it's it, as it exists it's sort of just like death and that if in its final form it it evolves beyond that to become something else i guess because probably the console doesn't have any control over it i guess right exactly i think that would be the end product is no one could control it um, yeah. and it just does whatever the hell it wants to do but even then you would then have the question of well what is it what is then the darkness that's motivating it right Mm. Uh, is it the history is it is it then ultimately the history of all that came before it and its creation and like you know witnesses all this suffering and decides to I, I don't know do whatever you know like you can think of the obvious like hopeful version of it but there's you know potentially just a more t tyrannical version of it like I, I don't know um, mm. interesting thoughts and similarly right like with the judging eye that the eye judges but the God of God seemingly has no will. It just is. And so how does that fit together? You know what I mean? Like a lot of still open questions. 
Yeah. I feel like the judgment, yeah, must be something inherent in Urwa, something, you know, just like it, you know, seeing someone is has long hair or, you know, right. whatever. Can, it's just can, a physic, like a real thing. Can that change, right? Like the, I guess, I guess that's part of the theory of like the no God, right? Is like, could the no God change the fundamental judgments of the universe if it reaches that point? Like if it's like... Capable of cutting off the world from the outside, can it then go beyond its programming and do more than that? Mm. And make it so that like, someone was suggesting that it can change at least through Mimara, which supports your Jesus mm. theory. Because someone was saying that Mimara, because she's seen from the God of Gods, can actually be like the, an agent of a God in some way and actually make changes on the reality of a soul. I think what, it's got something to do with the way she was telling about like when someone's dying, she's like, oh, I absolve you or stuff like that because she was well, trying to. What, what's interesting about that, too, is that it's like it wouldn't be like. In some ways, she is like. I don't know, even know if agent is the right word or or, or the other word that comes to me is avatar, but I don't know if that's yeah. accurate. I mean, the God of Gods doesn't have a will, but yeah, Mara herself does. And but she acts through the God of Gods like power you know to impact things yeah. which is an it's interesting interpretation yeah. of like the idea of jesus christ right as like this mortal who uses divinity to at, through, to like do an act of mercy right mm -hmm. it's kind of the idea of you know the crux and then you get you know in theology things get blurred as like is jesus just god you know is blah 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 father son holy spirit all that stuff but like the idea of that mimara maybe the God of gods doesn't, isn't, you know, is just judgment, right? Isn't, isn't even like Old Testament God as, you know, in Christian theology, maybe think of it like, it's not angry. It's not like, it just, it just is. More like know? nature, like right, the concept exactly. of nature, right? And that Mimara could, through that, through her own mortal will, rewrite reality too. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just me bouncing off of what you were saying, Dan. I, I think that I is. Mean, there's a lot of, in this series, there's a lot of like flipping the, prophet role on the other way around it's like you know the prophets are not people speaking you know other people about the gods it's the opposite it's ways for people to speak to the gods speak to the gods it's, it's like yeah like inverse prophets i think it's mentioned a couple of times like Mimara and Kellis are kind of like inverse prophets in some sort of way. Kellis explicitly calls himself that. Yeah. He was someone to go to the gods to speak to them of the mortal will. Yeah, because uh, the gods are blind to. I guess they don't care what the god, what the people want, right? They just their own thing. I'm in such a weird position with Kellis at this point, where I, <laughs> I, because there is still some ambiguity around him, where like, he's done a bunch of things that are inexcusable, but a part of me wonders, like, was he still in some way pursuing the right thing? Like, was it just tyranny, or like, like he's an evil person? But like, was he actually trying to save people? And then also, you know, part of what I feel conflicted about too is like, is it super satisfying to see him just get fucking played by this God? Or do I want him to have this contingency in place? You know, so theoretically in a third series, he still has mm -hmm. something going around. Even if it's not him literally spiritually still being around, but there's some sort of like, he has this plan to deal with the fact that, you know, like, why would he trust the God? Like, this is the God that's known as the liar, the tricks, like a jokely, like, well, that's the last person I would trust. You know what I mean? Kellis is like the smartest person in the world. So why, why would he just like knowingly go into that without a contingency in place? I feel like he has to have a contingency, but I just don't know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So Fair enough. what's the deal with Kellis and a jokely? I don't think I understood that uh, very much. Uh, he has a jokery as a decapitated head hanging from his waist, right? So how is a jokery still alive? And is it implied that they made a deal together and a jokery is supposed to help him out at this juncture? What what was going on there? I mean, a jokery, they can't like just like kill a jokery on the mortal plane because a jokery exists yeah. inside. But a jokery came into the inside or whatever you want to call it, you know, through Kellis and then later Nair. Hmm. Uh, and that essentially Kellis went to the outside and 
bartered with him. I, I, I don't know if yeah. maybe that's actually the point where like the connection happened and it just like reverberated back to the circumfix. Yeah. You know, it's I, implied that the stuff that happens after is the reason why the things in the first trilogy happen. Right. And also why Kalmomas was always not seen. It's implied that it's because of what happens after. So breaking the causality, right? The darkness that comes after, if you will. Yeah. As I mentioned. <laughs> um, it, it's... So, yeah. So he then possessed Kellis. My understanding is he, like, fully possessed Kellis and, like, betrayed Kellis. And was like, I'm in charge now, bitch. And then, uh, you know, and then he got played because he couldn't see Kel Moments because Kel Moments was the no god. Yeah. So how does he have him as a decapitated head? What, is it just a I think just toy? some essence of him was like, I don't think it was literally his head. I think he was okay. just yeah. like in a head. It could be anyone's head. But it looked mm -hmm. like his head with the four antlers and stuff when Malawibi has his moment of... It Fear. transformed. It didn't yeah. always look like that. It started becoming that. Like the four antlers appear. Oh. Yeah. Maybe Just some like head he brought from the outside or something. Yeah. Okay. It came through the head. Okay. That makes sense. I thought maybe the head always was a joke. Thing and Malawi B saw it for the first time. I, I think it, it was and it wasn't. Like I don't think that head was like physically. Like I think that head at some point belonged to a human being yeah. or, mm. or a demon. Mm. But either way, a Jokely like planted himself in the head and then okay. popped out at the moment. But I don't think the head always had four horns. I think it only had no. four horns when it's starting to manifest. Yes, in the... that, that's correct. The, the horns come out, they like appear. Yeah. There's some stuff okay. in the Warrior Prophet when he's on the circumference that I think a Jokely, that's when he, they make, they, maybe they make a deal or something, but. And after that is when we stop getting POVs from Kellis, or no, we, don't, we don't think we have very many after that. That is interesting. That, that's when he becomes much more, yeah, distant. What? Um, oh my God, my brain, I totally forgot what I was going to say. Maybe it was a Jokely try, just trying to contact Kellis to get him to make a deal so he could, you know, maybe a Jokely was the one with a plan all along, I guess. And we don't know if it's Kellos or Jokely that approached who approached who. Right? It is interesting to think too that th there's the implication. It's not even implied. Like someone, I forget who explicitly says that the gods trying to hunt down Kellos. It's not because like he personally offended them. It's because he was an agent of a Jokely and they were hunting down a Jokely. It was like this classic godly sibling rivalry, which I thought was great. On a similarish note, on a divinity note, I saw someone. <laughs> posit online the idea that uh the reason we don't see i mean i guess there's like a thousand gods or whatever so there's a lot of gods we don't see but that like gilgayal jilgayal however you say his name uh that he and a joke are actually one in the same mm -hmm. and that there's actually only 999 or, or 99 gods i forget if it's a hundred or a thousand um i think it's a thousand right thousand, a thousand temples okay. right um and that that is also why Kelmomis, the original Kelmomis, when he sees the vision, thinks he's looking at Gilgale because mm -hmm. they're like two sides of the same coin. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Which also feels like it would be thematically appropriate in terms of the war and being tied to the god of like hatred and lies and violent murder, you know? Um, Isn't they... I'm not 100% convinced of that, but I do think it's an interesting theory. And would, and would explain Loki, the brother of the god of war in Norse mythology. Yeah, right? they're like blood brothers. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, a lot of the Asia are, are war gods, technically. Um, but okay. Odin specifically, yeah, they exchange, they do a blood pact, and we're like, we're brothers now. Um, and Odin yeah. is explicitly a god of war. Okay. Yeah, I thought there was something there. They're associated in some way. I, I do love how he, Baker, mixed that sort of like traditional pagan like polytheism with the kind of abrahamic view of satan in a jokely where he has the horns but they're like these like antler horns mm, you know yeah. and he, he has this very like loki-esque mixed with like chrononos mixed with satan like uh, appearance to him uh, it's just very freaky and awesome he's he's terrifying 
think in the interviews he says explicitly that his starting point for the religion in Urwa was Hinduism, and then he started like merging it with like some aspects of uh, oh, Catholicism, and that's how he arrived at his, I guess, Thousand Temples religion. That's very cool. Interesting. What are, so, what are your thoughts on that, Varsha? As because you, you grew up Hindu, right? Yeah, I mean, I I did wonder about the fragmentation of the gods. I'm trying to remember whether there is uh there was anything about all the gods making coming together to be the absolute in Hinduism. I can't remember. I think there both is and isn't. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, the dimensions and I guess the, the number of gods and the way they look and stuff. That mm. was pretty... That, that makes sense. Was, was there any of that in the in a Joe Please like physical description that echoes a particular god in Hinduism? Is he supposed to be a boar, or am I thinking of Malazan? It... That's Malazan. You're okay. thinking of the war god from Malazan. Yeah, there is, there is. I don't know if there is a god of war. There probably is. I'm sorry, I'm not very well versed in Hindu mythology, but yeah, the there are gods with antlers and stuff. There's more demons actually. With all the famous gods are uh, of. They, they're like avatars of Vishnu that mm -hmm. I'm aware of or avatars of uh, Parvati and whatnot. So I don't know about the lesser gods. I'm sure there mm -hmm. are more. I'm not sure how much I don't know about Hindu religion, but what's the, like what happens after you die in Hindu? Like what's the payoff, I guess? Do you just go with one of the gods? Is there a paradise? Is do you need like the help of the gods in some way? As far as I know, uh, yeah. you there is a cycle of rebirth until you reach uh, Vairagyam, which I guess is uh, or Moksh. You know, uh, basically you improve as a soul each time you take rebirth until mm -hmm. you decide to free yourself from the shackles of life and birth. Basically, you have no attachments left to keep you here okay. in the mortal plane and then i guess you go to heaven uh, i think that's the point at which mm. there is a heaven in hindu mythology but i've always been confused about how that plays into the rebirth thing i i don't know if that's supposed to be like a intermediate resting place between rebirths mm. or uh or if that's where you go once you're done with the cycle of life and death. Mm. I think you're supposed to sort of disperse into the universe if you die, like once you are done with the cycle of rebirth. But yes, yeah, so I don't know how, what role heaven plays. Like I've always been confused about that uh, because we have both rebirth and a heaven. Mm. <laughs> it's, uh... There's no hell. No, there is. Uh, there is? Yeah, okay. there is a god of hell. His name is Yama, Yama Dharmaraj, if you know. And if you've read Lord of Light, there is a Yama in Lord of Light. And How do you go there? I think you... Yeah, that that's a good question. I honestly okay. don't... Like, maybe you get tortured for a while and then you go... There are mm. circles of heaven too. There is a book that writes about it. And I honestly, I don't know if any of these borrowed from mythologies like Christianity that came late, like the seven circles of hell, or was that, or did they borrow from the Hindu mythology? Oh, Hindu came before. <laughs> yeah, Hindu came before. Well, but Hinduism is like, definitely older. Yeah. But the, older. but the, some of the stories might borrow mm. from each other and come oh. later, right? So. I guess it's not unified, right? Hinduism with one single yeah. doctrine and, like and, the church. Yeah. And there's, you'll hear this, the same story, different versions of it mm. in different parts of the country too. Uh, I know like three different <laughs> versions of like one of the mythologies and depends on whose grandmother tells you the story, you might hear a different version. <laughs> is, yeah, is, is there a specific written down like, like book, like the Bible or the Quran or the Talmud? 
there there are several books there's the vedas there i think those are a lot of the mantras that are chanted during any ceremonies okay. there are the puranas uh, which i think tell stories of the origins of the gods there's the mahabharat of course which isn't right. the story of the god it's this and rama and the epics that were written down by sages there right. is uh, there's some yeah there there's a lot i'm sure i'm for upanishads there's a whole lot of holy scriptures and and i'm sure some of them all contradict with each other too um, i mean yeah that's that's a classic right like the bible has stuff that contradicts <laughs> within itself um you know same thing with the quran um mm. it, it's that's kind of a classic i mean and that's why you get so many arguments about well and, and it's not just even like the contradictions it's like how to interpret things within you know mm. individual passages right like that's what makes theology so complex and interesting um Yeah. and even me like as an a like religious person i find very fascinating is like are those contradictions and those debates about what exactly this means and um you know where where how to yeah how to interpret um these faiths and yeah. uh their tenets and you know what is more important and what is less important and you know what is a metaphor and what is meant to be uh, interpreted literally and and things like that i guess depending yeah. on what your faith is you might have someone that tells you exactly right. what yeah. it is <laughs> right the i mean in terms of hindu mythology the jokli gilgal being the same god makes sense because i mean this i'm completely embarrassed about this but i recently discovered that durga and some other goddesses are uh incarnations of the goddess parvati like it depends on the mood she is in and what, what she's doing and same with um shiva i think when he's happy and he's dancing he's nataraj when he's angry then he's got my Mah- i think he's maheshwar i don't know there's there's different names and mm. based on what they are doing even at the moment so it's exactly that thing exactly it is that sort of that that idea that i think is where the theory is based in is the idea that it's like yeah it's almost like different moods right or like what what the god is doing that would make him a jokely or gilgal um like homomas and samarmas exactly like homomas and samarmas right and you don't even necessarily always know when they're switched um it's it's uh, tied into kind of that uh, some something i saw someone point out which was really cool um is that you know a jokely is explicitly like his two big things are like hate and deceit and the two people he embodies uh very literally are the master of deceit kellis and the the living embodiment of hate nayer mm, yeah true i i i just was like when i that's figured that clever. i was like whoa yeah. that's like dude dude has been <laughs> thinking about it this entire time like <laughs> that's what's crazy to me to think about it. and now you 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 all have the benefit it, you know of, of the rereads right of like he's been like these gods were around the entire time he knew they existed the entire time he knew a jokely was you know playing these games with kellis the entire time you know that it's crazy to me to think with all of the moving pieces in these stories that he's had this you know going it's i can't wait to go back and reread at some point and just see all the foreshadowing and all all the little the working pieces moving behind the scenes like the gods yeah. in particular in the first trilogy i'm curious to see like where they're potentially influencing things it's and where they like sprinkled in things right mm-hmm. it it starts to ramp up in the second trilogy but it's kind sure. of like bits by bits right you get a bit more oh no we lost steve oh, he said he, he has to, to go to bed oh yeah. oh no unfortunate mm. right well, well we'll we'll get some more steve later um yeah i mean we're going to have other discussions on this yeah. yes for sure. Uh, oh my god, we've yeah, we've been talking for now like an hour and a half and we haven't even gotten into there's so much. Yes. Um mm-hmm. one thing that struck me was the default damnation that you get uh with the sorcerers and we find out from the people who well the dunyan are damned because they're just horrible to everyone around them, but the uh, but apparently the inkoroi or the progenitors of the inkoroi they were damned by default because they got too close to the absolute 
Yeah. So it seems like any messing with the what sorcery is arguably a way. I don't know what getting close to the absolute means, but I I interpreted that as whatever whoever's in charge, the god of gods, doesn't like it when you start to figure them out, and so you're damned by default. Yeah. What do you guys I'm make of that? Pretty sure Kellos said himself. Uh, Kellos. Uh, Baker said himself. Not Kellos. That. Uh, the sorcerers are damned because of how they kind of rewrite existence mm. and they do it in a way that's not it's not the gods doing it which is a lot kind of allowed i guess it leaves mm. a different mark so it's kind of like you getting dirty by going in the source or something you know what mm. i mean yeah yeah it's not a judgment on what they do it's just altering i guess reality mm. in in non-permitted way mm. So, so the god has rules and you're breaking them. And one of them is that that speaks a bit of uh, the tree of knowledge and like you the forbidden fruit right. and whatnot. Yeah, um, like a natural, I guess. Yeah, right? but but, but yeah. it's not even like willful, right? If, mm. if like if, if as Kellis describes, the god of gods is right. Is like the god doesn't even have the will; it just is. Mm. Like, and so yeah. that's just that's just natural law. We might call it right. And yeah. like, well, we associate law as like, it's the product of man or whatever, you know, like it's, it is willfully created. This is just, it just is, you know, mm. even the, the, the gods, you know, lowercase gods are not like, yeah. they can't change that. You know, yeah. this is just an aspect of, of what it is. I, I'm a hundred percent on board the, the phonem train of like. Yeah. You know, they were right all along, right? <laughs> Yeah, like the the Fonim were right all along. I I think that their their faith speaks most accurately to my point of view of the the series and the metaphysics and how it all works. Maybe they know me too. They kind of got some ideas right. Like yeah. you don't want to deal with the gods. No, the the only mistake they make is is in prescribing like a sense of like mercy or or goodness in the God of Gods, where it's like the God of Gods is beyond that. The God of Gods just is. You know, mm. it, it's yeah. not. It's neither good nor bad. It 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 just you know, yeah. it's everything. What I'm unsure is like the Cesarim. Are they damn? I think I guess they must be damned because other sorcerers can see them. Totally. But their effect of sorcery is not seen because they use like the. I think maybe it's because they use like emotion, which is more closely tied with the soul and so the outside. So it's somewhat more natural, maybe. You know, that's they something would. that's got to, that, that would have to be explored in the third series, I bet, because like, what is the difference there? Well, like, how, why is it that they don't have a mark? Are they damned too? I would assume yes, if only because they got so. it, but, you know, I, I, I don't know. But maybe the change they inflict is like sort of more natural, the way that it's coming through the emotion of the soul, as opposed right. to like the emotion of the whatever thing is in the inside that's anchoring the soul to the inside. Right. Which is maybe like the intellect might be what's, you know, of this world. And if you use your intellect to change things, then it's, I don't know. It's first people talk about it, but <laughs> it would yeah. be interesting to see what, what the exact difference is. What, yeah, what that's the... one I'm or, go, kind of no. disappointed not getting more information about the Cesarum and why they don't bear the mark. Yeah, hopefully, maybe third series. Sorry, I'm gonna go look ahead. at that interview. I think Baker mentions it in the interview I posted in the uh, that I posted in the forum about Cesare. Yeah, My mm. laptop is maybe about to die. It's plugged in, but it is freaking. Oh. Battery is not charging. Oh yeah, there's also another post here. Spoilers about from a Baker AMA that you can also read now. I, I may I may disappear yes. and then reappear upon my phone. Um, so just I, I don't know what's going to happen. Hopefully this doesn't destroy well, my phone. Look at this interview to see if I can see because he did mention it. Uh, but yeah, there is mm. uh, a nice. I like the notice and Anago just Suka seems to have come from humans directly instead of non men. Uh, no, that's a different question but that's interesting too i guess but suke is non-cognitive it has no truck with warring versions of reality which is why it possesses no mark and remains invisible to the few uh 
If so, you're okay. not damned, then everything comes down to meaning in Urwa. When source is representational, utilizing either the logical form, like the gnosis, or material content, anagogist, of meaning to leverage transformations of reality. The psuke utilize the impetus. Practitioners of the psuke bind themselves, blind themselves to see through the what and grasp the how. Uh, the passion of a cesarean call it the water. So it's Oh. Yeah, I guess it's that. Uh, yeah, it's got to do with then not cognitively making the magic happen, I guess, but emotionally make it happen. Interesting. Hmm. And it says here with it has no crop with warring versions of reality. So probably what sorcerers do is affect reality in a way that it's like making different versions of reality like clash against each other because it's mm. not how it's supposed to be so by imposing their will maybe they're just like you know getting marked themselves like that's why everything is also the effect of sources marked because it's not natural mm. so this is all don't bear the mark so they are not damned but they are sorcerers but they can yeah. still be damned by the gods i guess mm. the balance yeah. of the soul thing well this is our still has a mark and the argument itself still has them have mine, right? They can be identified sources, right? I'm trying to remember. No, the Cisarum bear no mark. Oh, even themselves? Okay, then then yeah, that's probably why. Then maybe they're, they're safe. Mm. Interesting. I wonder what Mimara would see if she looked. Would she just see yeah. their like mortal sins? Or would she see it's also interesting that she looks at Esmanet and she sees like an angel, like someone pure. True. For all the horrible shit Esmanet has done, that she's like in good shape. They're like, yeah. oh, she's done bad stuff. I mean, she's done some pretty bad stuff. And she and was the empress of like a horrible, horrible empire. But she was manipulated. I guess we did. Yeah, we did. it's not intention that matters. It's just action. I. We don't know it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, I don't know how that calculus, that the, the calculus of the judgment of the mortal soul is for that, like how that works well, out. Maybe a god favors her, and that's why she's not them. Mm. Yeah, maybe she's just redeemed through Mimara, that like the sheer act maybe. of giving birth to Mimara is what purifies her in some way. Could be. Also her baby, what did she see when she looked at her baby? He got blinded, so yeah, yeah. she screamed she, and she went blind, right? But like, what was that like in a good way? Like, unclear. So yeah. I get, you predicted, though, I think, Carl, like, oh, the way to go around the curse of your stillborn is having a twin, so one of mm -hmm. them is dead and one of them is not dead, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I that that just made sense after a certain point where it's like, okay, there's two babies. I mean, also just dramatically, it's like, okay, you introduce yeah. two babies, like series like this one of those babies is gonna die yeah <laughs> there's this weird balance that keeps happening right it's the same thing with Kilmomus and samarmus um seems like one kid is always doomed yeah i mean twins are bad luck in every <laughs> tradition somehow <laughs> right so the child's whale made all the shrank run away uh what do you think that means I I don't know. I feel Only like that's baby. setting up for a way to defeat the no god in the next series. Could it's it be just born kid? Hmm? Yeah, could it be a coincidence? But just maybe I wonder if like the first burn was born alive and the second one was born after the no god. Yeah, was I actually did wonder created. that. Yeah. Oh, I wonder. interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Does that timing line up? I feel like it that could timing... line up. Maybe. I don't yeah. see why it couldn't. Like, I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know if that's what happened. Because both reasons make sense also. Like, oh, mm. you need to have one dead to have one alive because yeah. of the lightning. But we don't know why the lightning is there. Interesting. Why the judging army. It's got something to do with pregnancy, right? Yeah, definitely. It, it was struck line. I wonder if it was something to do with the child. You, my, so, my thought is when, when I first read this, I, I'm, I forget if I said this when we first learned what the judging eye was. My thought was it, it is some sort of theological thing where like 
the spirit of this child that was never born, this like essentially the idea of like pure innocence, right? Like the, the concept of like this baby is just innocent. Mm. You know, it has not committed any sins. It cannot do anything wrong yet. So that there's a lot great power in that. And that that power then somehow like floods into the mother's soul and opens a connection to the outside that is the judging eye. I wonder if maybe the soul is still connected to the God of gods because it hasn't separated yet and gone into the body. And that's how the connection works, maybe? Right. It hasn't fully been separated because the baby hasn't come out into the world. Or because it's it's already dead, instead of going through the real world to go back to the outside, it just went directly back. It's like, I don't know. And maybe you need to be like a witch and also have twins or so, or, or and also have a child to maybe get some chance of getting the, which is not common, I think, because witches are not common, right? Yeah, true. Have that capacity to warp reality. I wonder. Hmm. But there might be other, there are other witches, I guess. Yeah, we they don't clearly know about have witches, but they must, there must be, right? I mean, she had the judging eye before she got pregnant, though, right? But remember, causality is not a thing. So if the baby was always dead, then it can affect things from before it actually died. Right? Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Could be that. Again, we have no proof. I have no proof of any yeah. of the things I'm saying. No, no, that makes sense. So, so it is that any witch who had a stillborn would have the judging eye uh, in theory. Maybe. Could have, could have the judging eye. Yeah, no, know. that makes sense. I'm, I'm talking to myself into it, but again. No... <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I think that the Mimara's child feels more of a Jesus Christ candidate than Mimara herself because of the making the shrank run away from <laughs> the first cry into the that, world. Mm-hmm. That, and... that is a powerful point. The, my, the only thing I'd push back is she has the explicit thought about Akamian as her first disciple. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. Like, that's a very specific choice of word there. Mm. Mm. And I'll also admit, it made me nervous. Just with this series, History of Messiahs, I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, you're right. I mean, I think that baby clearly... Certainly to me, the implication, the, the, more, the m- most obvious reading is she was blinded because of so much light mm. right that it is that the child that was born was so good mm. yeah um and that is who knows if that will remain <laughs> so yeah uh, i would be shocked in in a, in a story like this that a child could remain just pure like that mm. uh, but who, who knows well we don't um, know what purity means Maybe. Right, that's also, that's fair, right? Yeah, that doesn't could actually... be Maybe that he's destined to become a god and that's why he's so blinded, because... True. It... Yeah, we yeah. never... She never got to look at anyone inhabited by the gods, did she? So we don't know what she would see. Yeah. Yeah, he never looked at Kellus, I guess, even when he was not maybe inhabited. Yeah. Did she look, did at... look at... Nair? She looked at Kelmomas. Oh, she looked at Nair too, and he was just like the most damned person she does. Yeah, um, makes sense. Which I wonder if I wonder if a part of that is that just Nair, or is that maybe part of that also the Sifrang inhabiting him? Maybe it's both, right? Right, and that you know, so that association with hell is like just so powerful, so strong that she she didn't yeah. know what she was looking at. It was like she was literally looking at a demon. Yeah, I wonder if Mimara ever looked at Kilmomus with a judging eye. I guess not. What she must. She, she can't have. Well, I guess she would not. Would she be able to see any, anything? Because she did see the sarcophagus, though, right? I feel like the God of Gods can see the no God. It's just the gods that can't see the. No yeah, God. I feel like the God of the Gods, gods must be yeah. something the same thing as the no God, maybe some some sort of absolute. It must be the absolute, right? So it must share some, not have it's the restrictions left. of the other gods, which are limited in some way. Interesting, yeah. I mean, they have to be separate. Like, like I mean, the god, the lowercase g gods, and then the god of gods. Like, the, the lowercase yeah. g gods are just these, like, higher form of beings 
that are fucking evil. Like they're demons. Yeah. They're just like higher level demons, you know? Like again, yeah. the Fawn and the right. They got it right. Like that's just spot on based on how we understand them. And yeah. You know, maybe like the concepts in some way. Yeah. Like I wonder if that's just human belief or if that's actually like true maybe. to their out their innate like elemental function. They do seem to have some share something with certain aspects. But right. I do like the god of uh, what's it called the god of uh, disease. I think he's got a nice attitude because he's like one of the gods that favors people that fight against him. So doctors, yeah. it's a play. It's, it's a pretty cool attitude, I guess. Even if you're it making diseases, cool. but someone mm. has to, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. What are our thoughts on on Akamian and? Esmenet's ending here and Akamian, you know, rising up at the end, kind of being like, this is the moment I have lived my entire life for. I thought that was pretty badass. That was cool. Did he yes. die? No. It's no. unclear, but I, yeah, I don't knowing, knowing Baker, even when it seems like they die, the characters don't die. So <laughs> it didn't seem like he died, so I'm assuming he's good. I mean, a lot of sorcerers died and, and remaining ran away, right? Because didn't, didn't they... That's how it ends. Is all the sorcerers yeah. getting picked off? So I get, I guess theoretically, a Kamian could be part of that, but I doubt it. Yeah, because doesn't the whirlwind just pick up all the Kore and then shoot them everywhere? <laughs> it's pretty it's cool. crazy. It is crazy. Because I was wondering before, because they took out the Kore from the sarcophagus, right? So they could put Kellos in it. So it doesn't have the Kore when it actually goes right. out, but then it, yeah, it sucks them up. But. Then Kalmomus didn't need the lack of Kore that yeah. they thought they were shoving right. Kellis in. And so... I don't know yeah, if they put them back, though. But... They were mistaken mm. the entire time. I mean, they thought Kellis was the no-god. They were just wrong. Yeah. It was but, Kalmomus the entire time. Which is curious. What role do you think the Kore played in the creation of the no-god the first time around? It... I think it's just protection. Yeah. I, I think mm. it's entirely protect Because it's not part of the core. It's part of the, the yeah. carapace. It's the outer shell. So mm -hmm. I think it, it it's simply a matter of protecting it from magic. So and that's that why the laser was the only thing that could kill him because it's not magic, right? It's oh. technology. Yeah, I, I am increasingly of the opinion that the Heron Spear is just another laser gun. Yeah. Like there's nothing special about it. They just happen to get a laser gun, which they could mm -hmm. use to kill the No-God, which shows you how fragile potentially the No-God is too. Like yeah. I hope, you know, the next series doesn't just end with, someone picking up a laser gun and shooting it like that that would be <laughs> anticlimactic um yeah. it does make sense though mm. yes totally totally makes sense the the scene of the birth of the no god i thought was really cool like we've seen that in akamian's dreams not quite yes. the part where like immediately all the births happening around the world are still born yeah. and and oh the writing there about how the mothers knew that this it's more than just having a stillborn child that it sort of reverberated from before they knew what was going on they knew that the no god is back that that scene was absolutely brilliant that was so good yeah. i was so glad he did that he pulled back and showed the world like just the whole world knew it was just it just they could feel it all like that yeah. that was what yeah. we wanted to feel that the gravity of that situation and, and then it was also like Oh shit! That means everyone else is dead in the great ordeal. We're kind right. of fucked. Yeah, they're like, right? oh, they yeah. failed. Yeah. And then the great ordeal shits its pants, <laughs> and they all start running away. Yeah, I mean, they must be all dead because the shrank were also been coming from the other direct. It's like it, I can't. Maybe they, maybe the wizards are some will survive, but I can't believe anyone else survived. Maybe they do need. Yeah. I I so, am. What what do you, what do you think about the skill Vendi uh, amidst all of that, and then tied into that, maybe where they go next. I've seen some people think that think Moingus is going to lead the Skilvendi. I don't know why they would, other than that he's his father's son. Like, he's an outcast among them. Nier he said that... Spaws on, on his body. But Nier said, you know, follow what he says. I'm going to fuck you all up. <laughs> right? But, That's what he but said, if he's literally. dead. <laughs> but if he's yeah. dead. Yeah, but it's Nier. I don't know. It's... That's true. <laughs> I mean, I bet someone would still turn against them, but maybe then Moingus just like wins them by killing that person because it's not like Moingus isn't a badass himself. Mm. And and we don't know that he hasn't killed anybody; he just doesn't bear the scars for them. Right. So yes. <laughs> he was not of the people, so he doesn't mm. know their traditions. No. Right. That's what yeah. they need. 
<laughs> yeah. So then they did, yeah, didn't do much. Right? They just I'm, went I'm there here. and watched. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for the colonizer to come in and, and fix their fucked up culture. <laughs> I mean, not that his is much better, I will admit. Uh, it, it, he doesn't, I, I don't know, but like they, they need to get off their pro God, pro consult. Like they, they have about the worst culture imaginable. Like yeah. we just rape and pillage and subjugate women. And it's like, it is just so extreme, you know, it, it is like the most extreme form of like patriarchy and warmongering and raping imaginable. There's just yeah. like no room for compassion, yeah. which is absurd. Like even horrible warmongery cultures in like our history, most of them have like room for compassion and the Scovindi just yeah. don't, they just suck. <laughs> they're, they're, they're the worst. Yeah, the they they worship the no god right before so in the past yeah. are they worship we don't know what... as far as we know or some implications oh, in the past that they, they, did. they did in the past they 100% did. yeah I guess yeah currently I don't know about that but in the past yes so do you think they'll just pick up where they left off become a no god cult that's in... what I was wondering that's kind of what I was getting to when I was asking that's like what do you all think like they're going to do now in the apocalypse the second apocalypse are they going to be team like again if Moingus is power I feel like Moingus is not going to just like go yeah. quietly right mm. and be like yeah let's all just be team no god also the Dunsalt are they all dead they destroyed Gold so. didn't they who or did they destroy this Gold I don't think it destroyed Gold God I think it's okay. stronger than the Whirlwind. I think. So they're still out there. They're the last of the Dunyang, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess we won. What Maybe. is 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 Orax still alive? Yeah, he didn't die, did he? <laughs> no. So there's one more. There's one last Inkaroy. He's the last of the Inkaroy too. Yeah. I mean, he and... seemed pretty sad though. <laughs> yeah, Did you ex he loved his brother. <laughs> yeah. Do you expect him to be this snivelly little? I, I expected none of that. I did not expect him to love his brother. I did not expect him to be that pathetic. I, I expected none of it. It was crazy. And was it implied that he had a former deal with Kellis and was like, yeah, I don't care, and then shoved his face in something? Because okay. Orax had a moment with Kellis, like, this is not what we agreed to because his brother died. It's like, you. Why did I think you kill it was my saying brother? to McCarrick, maybe. Yes, being, oh, right? okay. I thought it was to Kellis. Okay, never mind that. Maybe then. it was something like, "Oh, we'll serve you, McCarrick, if you keep us alive." Kind of. Did McCarrick get killed? I don't think so. He just getting just so, ignored, kind of, right? I forget if a joke Lee like finished him off or not. I don't think so. I wonder, why do you think when a Jokli manifested in himself, why did all the Corey just drop on the floor and anchor? You know what I mean? Oh, Clearly he had some power over them. Mm. But how? Because they're not affected by magic, right? Because they're Corey. Yeah, the gods don't wield magic. But he's beyond that, right? Like, divine yeah. magic is different. Like, that's why, like... I get, Is it? We don't yeah. know. That. Well, yeah. I mean, it, there, there seems to be some delineation. Um, I don't know though. I mean, yeah, it is an interesting question. Um, yeah. I mean, the uh, Yatwar stool was able to bear a Korai, right? So but it's a human. That's true. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of some. Maybe it's not magic. Like it's if it's a god doing it, it's not magic. Mm. Maybe. Right. It's different. So yeah. maybe reality is what. A God says it is, so they're not really warring True. versions of reality. Yeah, and the core just, you know, assess reality. They just make it so oh, reality doesn't change. So mm. yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense now that you say it. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. There was a really nice line about death. Um, I I, I forget whose POV it was. Maybe it was Mimara that uh, existence is death. Everything else, um, yeah, you're just sort of, I don't know. I, I got the sense it was something about, or am I misremembering it from a different series? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think it was here. Uh, that effectively, like I am severely paraphrasing it, but like you're basically collapsing the probability curve at each point by making decisions. But then when you die, mm -hmm. you're part of the earth and, mm -hmm. and you continue to exist. So you exist when you die. 
and that's mm-hmm. what defines your existence um i interesting i don't have the quote handy but i thought that was a very interesting thing for her to say that that's when you sort of leave your mark on the world though mm. it's not like that's not necessarily how we think about it right mm. true i was thinking right now maybe we should assign each of us like homework and be like oh you research that thing and then come back <laughs> and tell us what theories you read about that specific thing i like that let's let's do this let's create a forum thread and give each other things to research and come back and talk about when we do those yeah. deep dives yeah there might be too much for everyone to look yes. at everything right <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I'm going to read that big ass interview that you mentioned. I wish, I wish someone did audio versions of all of these so I can listen to them while I talk. Well, the interview I linked was kind of short. There's a okay. different one in the forums. I, I think just, maybe you could just go to the sec, it's every called the second apocalypse forums. Mm, I think so. I'm or the know. three pound brain, is that just Baker's blog? That's his blog. Okay. There's the second apocalypse forums, which has a lot of stuff. And then I think some of the stuff in there is like requotes from the uh, Song of Irish and Fire forums because the initial discussions were on the Song of Irish and Fire forums. I think Baker also posted in those forums. Oh, okay. Okay. I think. Interesting. So they're kind of around a bit, but there's some, some requoted in the Second Apocalypse forums, which again are not used any, much anymore because it's been a while, but... There's still a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I feel I, I think the three pound brain uh, blog posts are more complicated, if I remember correctly. They're more scientific. They yeah, they get into like neuroscience and, and more like philosophical terms. I tried to yeah. read some of this stuff and it was like you just have to like know like you have to be pre there's knowledge you need to have going into them. They're they're not mm. explicatory. Um Okay. Yeah, I experience. At least the stuff I read was like, if I knew what this terminology meant, maybe I could understand <laughs> what he was talking about, but it was, it was extremely difficult. It's to like follow. arriving into a discussion when it's like halfway. Right, exactly. Halfway. exactly. Um, what do we, so yeah, what do, what do we think of the other, I don't know, what other characters do we want to highlight? Um, any particular so, who plot is... lines or moments or scenes. Um... When the dragon says Cayutis is named after someone, did he mean now Cayuti? Is that who he's yeah. named after? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's who he's named after. Yeah. Cayutis um... didn't do much either. Mm, no. Then... Yeah, I, I expected him to have more of a role and he didn't. Yeah. But there was something interesting about how he and Serva were practically twins and they were sort of skirting the edge of caring and not caring enough um, of having emotions and dealing yeah. with that kind of like Teliopa, which kind of made me like her more, Serva. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm curious to see if they've both survived where that goes if and when the next series comes i i would like more time with serva like yeah. not from sorville's point of view <laughs> yeah she's an interesting character i don't know where she would go next particularly in an apocalypse now that I her about her father because like everything she was doing was exactly right for her father right same yeah. thing with Cayutis. like their their entire lives have been based around this and now it's no more what do you do that's some existential shit right there you know yeah. i mean Akamian what, would be yeah. a good person to talk to because it came in had to deal with that i mean he sure. went and found something equally as unhealthy to get obsessed with which was their father yeah <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think of the fact that uh this was like many other prophecy stories in that callus cause the second apocalypse by trying to prevent it because if he never went to Golgotharad but again did he have any agency at any point he I thought he do did <laughs> I think it's it's a classic Greek tragedy I, mm-hmm. I love it I, I think it's great I mean we've seen that influence from early on um, Baker wears that on his sleeve and I, I thought it was artfully done 
Um, and it, like the best of them, it is still surprising how it all plays out. You know, that's the thing is like, even knowing that they were going to fail, I had no idea how they were going to fail. And that, that was what was so compelling to read about. Um, and, and was great. Um, and knowing that I, I went in like fully convinced Kellis was get doomed, was going to die, but I just had no idea what, you know, uh, mm. how, what exactly that was going to look like. And it was, it was great. It was, yeah. it's kind of wild to think that some random skin spy dusted him, but that, you know, that's how it goes. It was, I mean, then it was just an accident technically, right? Like Kelmomas was there. Like he was not. It, it is both an accident and not, and that Kelmo yeah. meant to be in front of him to prove his shit and to fuck with him, basically. And the skin spies meant to kill him, but it wasn't. None of that was supposed to like Kelmo. It was a grand plan by someone that was exactly. like, "Oh, I'm gonna do that and do that, and it's gonna happen." Right? It's like it's, as you I'm said, it's like a death of meaning. There's no meaning to what happened. There's yes. no planned revelation or arc or the good guys win over bad guys win. It's like it just things just happen, right? It is like intentionally anticlimactic for a man who's lived such a, a, a great life, not a good life, but a great life, right? And which is a major theme in the series, right? That these heroes are not good people, right? These like yeah. classes, the people who are lionized, they do great things. They are epic, they're inspiring, but they are not good people. They are, they are deeply, yeah. you know, a lot of the things that make them great are like acts of horrors, you know, that they commit. And none of them really die for a reason. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. That they just die as a byproduct of someone else manipulating them or just like, you know, they don't die for some, I guess they think they're dying for a bigger cause, but. Right. It's the hubris, really. right? It, it, yeah. They're, they're hubris. Of their death has no meaning, right? They're just deaths. Right. There's no redeeming quality to a lot of their deaths right it's not mm -hmm. like they're trying to save someone they're not trying to how did how did Seswatha die did he just die of old age Seswatha I think so because he had to go through the whole thing to create the heart which in my mind is kind of like some amulet sort of shit yeah. his soul, mm. maybe his soul is still there some part of his soul is still there I feel but did you guys read any theories about how why Akamian saw different dreams towards the end there? That's another thing that. I can't think about. Yeah, what the hell is up with that? No, I hadn't read anything about that. Okay, I we have to add it to the list of yeah. things to research. Well, I have a fear of why he sold Naikayuki, right? Which I think I already explained. Mm, can, yeah. can you repeat it? I've forgotten what you said. I think it's something to do after the Noga died, Saswara went and took part of his soul from the I don't know, sarcophagus or something. And then he put it with in the heart, which contains part of his soul, and I guess now came to soul. Something like that. It's got he got some part of his soul and put it into the in some way. Or maybe because it's his son. There's some connection oh. there, and they keep the souls went into the whatever it's called, the black heart, whatever it is, and that is some sort of amulet because it, it acts some in a similar way. Right, if you think about it, it's just a yeah. mel melding of souls in some way, right? Mm. Here, here is a, a, a kind of tied to that a theory. Um, what if this is like a lot of the visions of the future, really mm -hmm. just the future echoing back and the impact of the future echoing back upon the past? And so, Akamian's visions are mm -hmm. visions sent back from the No God. In the future maybe not even intentionally but like the what am mm. i who am i sort of deal that that phrasing that that keeps like mm -hmm. go echoing through time that it's like the no god's existence echoes across the souls of like the people but why would akimian have a special connection with a no god to be able to well, see that's it. what i'm saying uh, so so the, the the hole in this the mystery is that Akamian in some way mm. does have some sort of interaction or connection with the no god mm. in the future in this theoretical third series that yeah. leads to that then echoing across time through mm. then of course now KUD who's you know obviously connected to the no god for obvious reasons and then the, the additional the part that would lean into this is if we get a third series and Akamian starts having visions of Kelmomus yeah would then sort of tie into that um but I, I don't know could also see it in some way of the gods, you know, sending, in, you know, affecting a Kamian 
and they get revealed in the third series as something even happens in the past. I could also see that. For sure. Um, yeah, any vision, right, is potentially the gods interfering. Potentially. Um, I really want to go back and read the, the Circumfix scene now. That's mm. one of the big scenes that I wish I don't have the Warrior Prophet with me. Um, I want to go mm. back and, yeah, just see. Maybe I, I can see if I can get at a library. And just just read through that and see Kellis's visions and like what what is it he's is there a head on a pole there I don't know what the fuck I is don't the head there is I'm trying to remember when I'm gonna the... hunt Baker down and have him tell me what the hell the hell head on the pole is uh, try to look for the forums I guess there must be there's a lot of theories about the head on the pole a lot of people are like what the fuck is the head on the pole <laughs> understandably and... it's not very and Sarva had a had a moment when she was fighting the dragon that she was this place, right? So again, with the people equals place equivalences, and mm-hmm. I don't know what to make yeah. of it. Yeah. It. I mean, talking about hubris to me, that just again speaks to the same honesturing bore pride, and mm-hmm. the sense that they are beyond a person. It, mm. it is them getting very much caught up in the moment. Uh, I I am of the opinion that that is. I mean, there's some truth to the idea that they are greater than your average Joe. But again, greatness, you know, it comes with this cost. The cost being the people are massive assholes. And, you know, I kind of feel like that's maybe a bit like she was doing good things there, killing that dragon. But I also think that she has an enormous ego uh, that probably yeah. needs to be checked. Um that said, yeah. she probably did the single most badass things, like multiple of them here in this final sure. uh, few chapters, you know, from saving a Camion and all to, you know, I mean, she got torched like multiple times and came out alive. It's pretty impressive. Um, all right. Do we do we have any other last things we want to talk about or move on to quotes without Steve? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Of Steve's oh, I try. <laughs> Gone too oh, soon. The blasphemy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess. And so, what? I guess. What did you both feel? Now that it's finished, you have everything that's being written. What's your final judgment on the thing as a whole? I loved it. I felt like the series is very much it. It's weird in that I feel like the series very much is a lot of the critiques of it. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like a lot of the criticisms you hear are absolutely accurate, but they also are lacking in nuance and lack, to, like, fail to mention the ways in which it is great and the ways in which it is more than that and the way those flaws are sometimes um, one part of a larger picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, you know, I think one of the obvious ones that we came back to frequently was like, you know, questions of like sexual violence and d- depictions of women. And, you know, in the first trilogy, I really do feel like uh, Baker failed with a lot of his, like, like Surway, I, I just don't think was a good character. I, and mm-hmm. um, I'm not sure reread will change that. Um, I think there are ways of writing a waif and leaning into that without making her so genuinely like two dimensional. On the other hand, clearly, I mean, the man is not a misogynist. I do not think the series is a misogynistic. Uh, I mean, Esmond that alone is like, like she's arguably the most compl- complex dynamic character in the whole story. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, and then he makes a point of pushing back against that with the back four books. Um, that said, you know, I do feel like the series sometimes like I, leans too hard into trying to be grim and shocking and ab- abhorrent mm. um, to the point of it just feeling like, dude, you're just like, like, this is, it's not even impactful. Like, I, I think of always the scene in the first trilogy that I, I um, of the two little boys who are watching Mathanet leave. This is in the Thousandfold Thought, I believe. Mm. And we watched one of them get like kidnapped, I think at the end to be raped or something. And the other one is like runs off, barely escapes, I think is what happens. Or like even he gets killed. I forget exactly what happens, but it's just like this horrible scene. That's like with two characters who don't matter at all. And it's like, why, why is this 
Like we've seen this. We know children are abused in this world. Like this isn't anything new. You're not adding anything to the story. So like in that way, again, I feel like a lot of the criticisms level of the series are true. But at the same time, that is so far from what the totality of this work mm. and how, and it is easily among the most complex stories I've ever read, re like regardless of medium, you know, regardless of genre. Um, it just has so much to say. There's so much depth to it as evidenced by the fact that you can get so many rereads out of it, Dan. Right. And, um, and it has wonderful characters too. You know, a lot of very thematic works have flat characters, not so here. There are some really wonderful characters, really wonderful storylines. The prose is great. At times it veers into being incomprehensible, <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the same time, it is it is that same spark that lights, you know, the the brightest fire um, that that creates these passages. You know, I'll never forget that are so powerful um, and so compelling. And so I I am grateful to have read it, and I I think it's phenomenal. And I wish more people would read it. How about you, Varsha? Yeah, I I think I echo a lot of what you said, Carl. Um, I think for me, yeah, the writing pulled me in right from the first book I thought a lot of it was quite beautiful and that when that works for me I think what the story almost becomes secondary and I think this book was also a bit of a I think learning exercise for me in terms of he has <laughs> these aspects of philosophy that I guess he's trying to explore and I think he talked about maybe in the interview that you shared, Dan, on the forum about how he wanted to tell a compelling story while also being able to, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but being able to explore the philosophical aspects that he did. He wanted to be able to do both and he wanted to make the story work on multiple levels. And I feel like he succeeded with that ending. You could just read this without trying to follow along or like trying to... I think there's a lot of things that I don't quite know how they work or where the philosophical origins of things that you could maybe sit sit and think about if you want to grapple with that. But also just a very surface level reading of the story with that ending that we got with all those twists and knots in the story. I think that just works. It's It's a very compelling story overall. And... There are parts of it that will make a reread pretty difficult for me. Like like the whole thing with the scalding and the eating of the scalding, the depravity there, the scalded, sorry. That was very difficult for me to digest. And and I think the, the running thread of implication in the series that when left to default devices, to like any pursuit of knowledge must end in such depravity right like even with the last section that we just read the uh, progenitors created these I, I don't remember the sequence of events there but whatever it was they did in their pursuit of the absolute to the point where they didn't care about any accountability they did whatever they wanted to it led to depravity which I think is not a very flattering view of humanity like if you don't have something enforcing you like what he called the god and the heaven thing that makes you behave that you this is what you would default to i think that is a running thread which i don't agree with but the fact that i can think about it and argue with that is makes a book very interesting and important to me even when i don't fully agree with what it is saying so yeah i, I think overall i'm like really happy to have read it it might be a while before I forget <laughs> enough about the sc scald it to reread it, but I think um, it it did made make for a very good reading experience to be able to think about it and talk about it with you guys as well. Yeah, I think one thing with the world is like it's kind of him showing, well, see what happens to society when kind of women are relegated to such a you know like they have no power and they cannot affect anything like that's kind of a ways also that it's kind of in in a way not misogynistic in a like very convoluted way in showing that okay this is what would be a, 
very patriarchal society, an extremely patriarchal society, and see how shit it is, I guess. Right? Right. That both makes sense and it doesn't because where is he... I feel like to make that point, you also have to give me an example in your world of a place where women are doing well and therefore people are good, right? Like if that is the point that is being made, Mm. then there are no pockets of goodness, if that makes sense. Other than like Mimara and Esmanet seeing each other as these uh, angels who will go to heaven, there aren't pockets of goodness in the world that are female driven or any mm. other way driven. So like, where is the redeeming factor, I guess, is my I, question. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I feel like you're almost t- talking about two different things here, um, although they are related in that, like, I, you know, I, I, I agree with you that like, um, what's the phrase, uh, Dan, that like showing something is not endorsement. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. You, you know the phrase that it's like you know like for another example it's like lolita is like a book about how like fucking gross this guy is even though we see it all through his yeah point of view, he justifies it right and i think he gets with the little girl in the end uh it, it's you know miss the point right but they miss the point of that right fight club is like a similar story although that's even more on the nose because it's like with how it ends anyway um and i agree with you i think that that is definitely the case um i do think that there it, it is a part where you like, you could say, well, if there are no women shown strong, like in any, like with any depth with, then it would be even more so right. Misogynistic. And it would fail to really maybe get that across, but like you have Esmanet from the get go. And so even though she is the only one, I feel like in that first trilogy, she does exist. And then the second series, I feel like really elevates it. So you do have like powerful women and powerful women organizations. We see things from yacht were, uh, perspective, and then we see the Swayali sisterhood, and we see Mimara and her, her journey, and Esmanet now as this empress and how she makes use of her power, and so so I I feel like the second series in particular does a much better job at kind of showing the spectrum, um, and 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 adding a lot more nuance, yeah, to the things you talking about, including talking about what she did does do in the first series about how the, the ways that you know women can can do terrible things too, right, and it's not just all the violence yeah. being done them but the way that they can perpetuate those that violence but it's also you know you you need to realize that even if women can be in power in specific circumstances it doesn't change the framework of it being a patriarchal society which right, also affects exactly. these women right and that that's highlighted i think most powerfully in, in esmanet's storyline right yeah. that she is the empress and she has all these moments but like really she's only able to act through kellis right and even then, and then when that starts to get threatened, when that gets taken away, she's suddenly powerless again. Yeah. And she um, wants to do big different things sometimes, but she's like, shit, I need to keep, right. I need to keep power. I need to do the bad thing because, right, that's in, what society expects. That's what the world expects. In terms of what you're talking about, Varsha, and it's a thing that I struggle with, with this series too, is because it's bleak, right? Um, and a lot of the characters do really terrible things. Um, The pocket of goodness that I found that I I found particularly interesting with how it being how the series ends is that quiet. It's uh, it's literally not quiet, but the birth, right, of this baby being born and this little family reuniting and not and for all the horrible things they've done to each other, they decide to stick together. Right. And Esmanet has every reason in the world to reject Akamian in that moment. But instead, she welcomes him and in fact, scolds him and is like, you need to help this woman because she is, you know, birthing your child. And I thought that that was a wonderfully heartfelt, I really wasn't sure how that was going to play out. Uh, And I actually felt that it played out in a relatively optimistic way, um, which I did not expect because the first trilogy did not end, I felt, with any ray of hope at all. Um, It really is bleak. And which was fine. Like it was a great ending. But this, I felt like actually had much more heart and hope uh, inherent in it, despite the fact that the world is literally ending. So, you know, uh, but just cause the characters seem to reach a point of like maturation and emotional, uh, just compassion, you know, that they, they, they felt things for each other and they were there for each other in a way that was very selfless. And that spoke to, I think the better parts of human nature, um, which, which is, I think in some ways what you were getting at is right. Where it's like the series is so consumed with how 
horrible humans can be that it doesn't very often stop and pull back and talk about the ways humans can actually be very good too. Uh, Cause that absolutely exists, right? It's not, yeah. it's not an either or thing. It's, it's both, both are true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you've, you've stated it exactly right. It is, it is an unmitigating look in my opinion of just how horrible we can be to each other. But, um and and yes i i do like the esmenet memara akamian moment that that was a very nice ray of sunshine in all of it um but and i suppose that that's what that is like some people working through their nonsense to be good to each other no matter what they've been through so yeah that makes sense Any other final questions or thoughts, or should, shall I we guess, do? The... Are you both somewhat happy if the next book never came? Is this a somewhat satisfying conclusion? Because I don't know if there's any guarantee there any book. I I would put it as like a fifteen percent chance personally. I Maybe would would come to terms with it. <laughs> it certainly wouldn't be as frustrating to me as never getting the rest of a song of ice and fire. <laughs> Like, I feel like this is an ending. And while there's a yeah. lot we don't know, I feel like storylines have been completed and characters have reached the end of arcs. And like, it, it does feel like an ending, even if it, in many mm. ways it's kind of a cliffhanger. It opens up a lot and that there are questions that haven't been answered as we've discussed. Mm. Like, there would always be things I'd be frustrated about. The head on the pole. Yes. <laughs> it's that fucking head on the pole. Um, but, you know, like, I... I yeah, I would say overall, I would be satisfied with it. You, Varsha? I, I think so. Uh, there are a lot of questions I have about where this mm -hmm. will go, but I, I, I could reinterpret this, I guess, as uh, what did we call it before, like a Greek greek tragedy thing where it's like you mm. just set out to do something and you completely fail at it <laughs> um especially that moment of immense hubris that kellis has where he's like i am the absolute and then the next scene it turns out the no god has come back the next time we see kellis it's like no nope, yeah. no nope. that that speech you just gave that was all for nothing I think it would take some reinterpretation of the series for this to be the conclusive ending for me, like to accept it as an ending. But um, yeah, I could I could make my peace with it. <laughs> but I would love for the next book to happen. Yeah, I guess it's a true death of meaning sort of ending in bed. Yeah, there's no reason for things to happen the way they happen and to end where they end in real life. So it just this just ends. With... Yeah, yeah. I feel very strongly that Kellis isn't always has been the main character of this story, and we have seen potentially the end of his story, and that he's the one most directly tied to, to the main thematic mm. th through lines of this series, um, and that you know not that our other characters aren't super important, like in some ways they're more important because they're the heart of the story. You know, yeah. they, they they are our, our point of views and. They also have thematic depth, but um, I do feel like this is Kellis's story, uh, first and foremost. I mean, there are only three people that could be. It could only be Kellis that came in or Esmenet, right? Mm. Yeah. It... Are you sure it isn't Nair? I don't know. <laughs> that well, dude just like it came in, but you yeah. You can't keep a bad guy down. True. If we got more of his point of view in the second tr trilogy, in the second four books then yeah i could get behind that but we no, didn't I know, get not. enough of him unfortunately yeah. not at all the i i thought Callus being the no god would be an interesting what's what i'm looking for continuation of the fact that each series is named after Callus, like the prince of nothing and the second mm -hmm. what the aspect emperor and mm -hmm. the no god is also Callus. But I guess that's not to be. Oh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> yes, of course. I will not be surprised by anything, but if he actually wrote more, it actually ends up. 
Mm. We have to backwards theorize now. How can the no god still be Kellis to make that work? I I don't know. With souls and like inhabiting, I don't know. Maybe soul. Maybe Kellis put his soul in Kellis. <laughs> Who <fuck laughs> knows? I mean, with all his ability to world hop and go to the outside and stuff, like yes, the turning to salt is makes sense because of Kellis as being this element of chaos, but also. That feels like it feels impossible to me that Kellis wouldn't have figured out a way to overcome his vulnerability to Korai. It, I mean, it's not that he's not turned into salt at the moment. Like I, this, the soul maybe there is he's found a way to soul hop with bodies right. or something. I was going to say is like I don't feel like Kellis could find a way just by the the literal limitations of the, like the rules of the universe to like avoid getting salted if Korai touches him but maybe have a way to survive death, essentially. And yeah. that I, I agree with, that I think he has to have contingencies in place. And and he know, did he maybe. say something about having conquered death? I forget. But I, feel like that, but I feel that it was because of his plan of sort of ascending, I feel. Mm. Right. He seemed pretty in the final, you know, uh, discussion. He was like, "Oh, I'm, I'm gonna be, you know, I'm gonna go. Yeah, I'm gonna go to afterlife, but I'm gonna rule there. I'm not gonna be, you know, falter." Hmm. It seems oh, like I, such yeah. an obvious thing, but I, I it was totally not on my brain to think that his plan this entire time is to conquer hell. I was like, <laughs> "Oh fuck!" Like, yes, that makes sense. Of course, that's what your plan is, but I. To per my brain, like that wasn't even on my radar. Yeah, as if you think of it, that was it's really kind of the only solution. Either that right. or close it, you know, close it from the outside, right? That's right, the only exactly. real. Like, you do the consult thing, or you conquer it and just don't let it work the way it has been working. Or in my, in my I think he's just wanted for himself. That's but I don't trust Kellis. I don't trust that guy. That that's valid. I. <laughs> To me, it's hard to tell how much, of, like, how selfish is he genuinely versus how much is it that he, because selfishness almost requires more, like, like, he certainly has a lot of pride, but is he a genuinely selfish person, you know? Like, I I, 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 I don't know about that. Um, I think he does genuinely believe, like, I think he has a very real messiah complex. Mm. But this is what's great about Kellis is we don't know for certain. So all we yeah. can do is interpret his actions and we can debate about it, right? Like there's, there is no right answer here because it is so unclear. It's not like a Kamian or Asmanet where you can like pretty clearly lay out, you know, who they are. Like, and there are depths and there are layers, but like Kellis, he has those, but we don't know them. We don't fully understand them. And, yeah. and so it's impossible to say for certain. We are just like, you know, we see the results, but we don't right. know what came before we're, you know, Kellis' right. soul is the darkness that came before, which we don't have. Like, does right? he does he love Esmenet? I think he does love Esmenet. At this point, I think that he genuinely means yes. it when he says that. But that seems so weird. Like, yeah. you know, I, I it, it doesn't seem to fit. But we don't know what moves his souls, what makes him do what he does, right? We don't. It's the... interesting. Oh my! I got the impression from that last speech that he gave to the Mangaka sorcerer and the Dunian that he did whatever he did for himself not mm. for the survival of the world that yeah. if that happens that's a happy side effect but it that wasn't his goal saving the world wasn't necessarily his goal it was to still to attain the absolute and he decided to do it this way that's the impression I got, but I'm I'm trying and failing to remember what it was that made me think that. I, part part of part of my issue with that scene too is because it is to me unclear exactly who is talking all the time. Mm. So when is mm. a joke the image? You know, it's I think it's clear at a certain point when he's taken over, and I think it's clear pre pretty early on that Kellis is still talking. But there's at some point there's changes being made, and I think like with. Again, going back to Kelmomus and Samarmus, there could have been a lot of switching back and forth throughout that dialogue, so that it, it, it's it's hard to say for certain, right? I like what? Yeah, like I feel like the parts where Jokri's talking, they're like bolded or something, or in a different script, 
I think. Because it must be like, he must, there must be something conscious Kellis does to be like, okay, now you can go through me. I His feel. voice changes. Yes, that is very clearly a Jokely. But I think a Jokely sometimes speaks before that. I think yeah. it's like when his appearance, like a Jokely inhabits him before the appearance fully changes. Like, I, okay. I think that. It, I, yeah. I don't know that that's the, I mean, I don't know. I would get, I would have to read it closely again, yeah. see if like, if it, it is very clearly like, this is when a joke least talks. This is when Kellis is talking. Yeah. I don't know. But I got the sense that like before, like there were several lines, I feel like when a joke was like transforming into him that like, it was a joke we talked yeah. not Kellis. Okay. The I, way he was yeah. to them. And it, it wasn't bolded yet at that point. I feel um, like Kellis's idea was like a joke we would get the souls in the inside and he would get what's in the outside, I think. But from from his speech. And from what we know before, right? Because he talked to Jokely in like several sequences in previous books, right? Saying like, right. oh no, you can't have this or whatever. Or who no, it says who better to give like the the grain that the person you know cultivating it or something like that there's there is some, there is one of those sequences okay. where he's yeah. like oh you know I, i'm i'm not going to give you the grain and then he's like oh no who better you mm. need to go back <laughs> was it in these four chapters or was it before that no 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 like two books ago or something oh. one of the visions he has where he's talking to a jokely in the outside and he like a joke is under the tree or something. There's a gold under the tree, and they're talking about the granary and souls being mm. the grain. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. And be something he protect the the grain from being destroyed. So mm. There was some you know metaphor like that. And then yes. the person who's supposed to protect it, then he's like, oh well, who better to you know give it away? I guess than the person mm. tending it. Something along those lines. Yes, I I it, seem to. It, there was some that. sort of deal going on, but who knows who was truthful and what other machinations were. Where, it's right? always the thing, right? Is a joke we could be lying at any time. Kellis could be lying at any time. <laughs> Every time like, we've seen Kellis, he was also like, okay, well, we know what's happening, but there were always things that we didn't know that ended up yeah. being that oh, he had bad and bad and bad plans after that. So, I guess one thing I didn't ask is like. Uh, what did did you know? Like, um, well, I guess the inverse fire, right? That's also something that was mentioned before, and that we actually get to know finally what it is, because that's also what now Coyote sees when he goes through the golden room in the previous mm. book, right? And that's I why, see. yeah, everyone that sees it just be, goes to the side of a console because it shows you like in Eternal of Torment in hell mm. yeah that's terrible i mean that was cool that was a cool reveal i was a fan of that um i don't i i i, I feel like i don't have a lot of thoughts on it though mm -hmm. other than like yeah that makes sense i think like, i read that, that all the people that see it get corrupted because they see themselves in hell because all the people that go there to see it are all like how to say they're not nice people yeah. You know, they're not they're very ambitious people they're very they're not just like you know i'm a nice person that doesn't have huge plans or whatever right and that's why they see themselves damned in hell and maybe if it was just like it i don't know esmond it wouldn't see herself damned in hell i guess because it's just some sort of continuum that shows you the future about your soul right. that's still connected to the outside in some way because as we know there's no past and future mm. Yes. So yeah. Apparently, that was how they were converting everyone. So uh, Kellis didn't go to hell then because he didn't see himself there, and that's why he wasn't affected by the inverse fire. Yeah, I guess he saw himself somehow reigning in hell or whatever. Some other. Mm. So what? What does Entry salting do to your soul? Does do you still die and go to heaven? Sorry, hell, or do you just get trapped here somehow? I think Baker said that salting is like an unintended effect of it's not like a crucial part of what the Cory do. It's I just see. something that happens, but it's not it doesn't mean anything. So what does the Cory do? What I think it, it just reassert reality the way it's supposed to be. Okay. 
okay, and I create salt it's, in the process. <laughs> Uh, oh shit! What was I going to say? <laughs> My brain is slowing down. Um, I guess you know. While you're thinking, you know what I would really like. I would have liked if he came out with a role playing setting or system yeah. in this universe. That that's be what fun. he did originally, but like, I <laughs> feel that would be really cool to have. That would be cool. I would be down for that. Defeat the no god in Golgotha. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you can eat, have some... eat your scalded well, brothers. <laughs> yeah, because I also feel like they would give us a lot more lore that we don't have. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I would better understand the human cultures. <laughs> so the yeah. history of Eerva was that put together using the appendices and the book, or do yes. they have it's just more a collection of everything that's written and then he found from his interviews and other things but it, okay. i think it's all confirmed <laughs> all the stuff in the history of Erwa is actually written down by baker himself it just collect collected in organized way because mm. i remember when i was reading the history of Erwa, i remember some of the parts like dispersed through different books it's like okay, oh, okay. now it makes sense of you're all putting it together kind of okay okay some parts are like i don't know where the fuck you read it <laughs> i assume the appendices because there's so much information there yeah Right. Yeah, I was I was looking at the appendices and it looks like you could read it for this series without spoilers either. Like for instance, it doesn't tell us that the no god is or even the ark for that matter, I don't think, is a machine entity. So mm. I'm I'm trying I guess the question I have is why did Baker think it's so imperative to give us the appendices with that like what other parts of the appendices that we should know um because he split the book into so that we could have the appendices yeah uh, i i think it's simply a matter of he wanted to have the appendices mm -hmm. you know in the same way that tolkien did he's like I, I have this world like i know people want this shit so here yeah. it is <laughs> I guess the appendices in Tolkien, though, they do provide an extra conclusion because there's the conclusion of that's what true. all the storylines of all the characters end up that's, being. That's a good point. They, mm. It goes, it's an epilogue beyond the epilogue. That's that's a fair point. Mm. And the language also is, I guess that's the main point, what's the starting point of a book, so it makes more sense. But mm -hmm. I haven't actually read in detail the appendices, so I'm going to do that and see if I, there's something else I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm for sure going to read these. Yeah, I'm going it, to read it. It'll be a too. process. It, yeah. So I feel take... probably some of that stuff I read in random forums at some point. I'm sure. If it's yeah. relevant. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Anything else? Quotes then? Yeah, let's do quotes. Yes. Let me pull up my Kindle book. Mm -hmm. I guess I have one right here on the page that this is this <laughs> random page that I'm on. Let me wait. I lost it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll just start by saying, you know, I'm a big fan of these epigraphs. Chapter 17's, the more cunning the lie, the more it exhibits the form of truth, the more it lays bare the truth of truth. So do not fear the scriptures of other men to drink deep from the cup of lies as the cup of lies is to grow drunk on truth. This is from uh, Epistles, well, you know, one of the books within uh, the Tusk, the book of the Tusk. Um, and, I, and, and what's interesting about this is it essentially takes what I think begins to be sort of an interesting um, philosophical idea and then, of course, warps it to make it this religious treatise you know of like this is yeah. you know it's interesting it, that it's in the tusk though i would have thought that? it would be interesting if it's in the tusk i would thought mm -hmm. it would be more like a proverb or some philosophers well that's what treatise, i feel like the right? first yeah. part almost would be right it sounds like something the yeah. genesis and then it's the second part that makes it oh yes mm -hmm. this is a religious text yeah. this is telling you how to think and what to do yeah yeah. <laughs> Nay, the world is not equal in the eyes of the God. <laughs> okay. 
That's cool. nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, to smother sight is to strangle hope, for direction is the bounty of vision. I don't remember what the context was for this. But it was in the middle of a battle. For the people scene. that don't see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's hope it's not true. No, I, I don't think it's about um, being or I, I don't think it's about being blind. I think it's about mm. not having visibility into what's happening uh -huh. in the battle. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because and the preceding line is and with the encroaching black came a horror and a dismay, a premonition of doom that no heroism or fervor could dispel, that for more and more souls resolved into the breathless tingle of futility that was the certainty of defeat. To smother sight is to strangle hope. <clears throat> so while you're in the middle of looking at something and feeling hope, <laughs> to have that surrounded by blackness, I think that is what it's commenting on. Let's see. What else? Do you have any, Dan? Uh, I would if it wasn't so annoying to get quotes from Kindles. Oh. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm literally scrolling page by page. Yeah. <laughs> to see my the highlights. I think <laughs> I like it. Page 442. Mm -hmm. This gets at what we were talking about earlier about it came in. The line is, Apocalypse was his birthright. Mm. It goes yes. so hard. Just yes. so, so hard. There's yes. pathos there. So it's not just like, it doesn't just sound badass, which it does sound badass. Mm -hmm. Like the motion there. And I, I'm pretty sure Baker's probably not echoing off of this quote, but there is mm. a quote from a famous freedom fighter in India, like during the freedom struggle, who said, Swaraj is my birthright and I will have it. Swaraj is independent rule. And, uh, but apocalypse is my birthright, <laughs> like an echo of that. <laughs> very, Love it. very grim though. Like apocalypse, yeah. like the end of all things is mm. yes. my birthright. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah. And that he, he's whatever control he has, like, it, the doom of it, the sense of doom that comes with that knowledge, right? That he's destined to deal with something that will bring about the doom. But I guess that's his luck, right? Because he's a sorcerer, so he's destined whatever he does to be damned. Like there's nothing he can do. Like he's doomed from the start. That's true. That is true. So maybe, and so here's why the whole sorcerer, like damned by default thing, isn't sitting super right with me for this world. Because let's say a Kamian does manage to save the world, but. The fact of his being a sorcerer would still damn him. Yeah. And there is nothing he can do to redeem that. <laughs> Anything he does as a sorcerer will only make his damnation darker. Uh, by the way, that's... did we... Go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say, I, yeah, that's the inherent, you know, injustice of this universe, the horror of it. It's the horror story, the cautionary tale. And you could just leave it at that. But I do think that there's a chance that a, an additional story does have them rewriting reality to undo that mm. either to rid the world of magic or to undo <coughs> the that cost of magic yeah yeah the um did we talk about the fact last week that when Mima, when akamian looks at kellis the mark mm -hmm. he bears is heavier than what he saw on nil gekkas mm that that was really something like what nilgek has accumulated over millennia uh Kellis has in 20 years what happens when you go to the outside <laughs> you're really cooking on like, like hyper speed well he also did invent a new school of magic right mm. the witches school of a meta gnosis because he does he's not he's Magic is not just gnosis; it's metagnosis. Mm. It's like an oh, okay. extra level, even more. To, yeah, yeah. I think in the appendices, it's and it specifically mentions a separate thing mm. from the gnosis, and people also mention it. So with the three layers of meaning, not just the two that the gnostics could yeah, use. Yeah, something like that, right? 
and him not having to speak mm. to do some of the stuff, it's like, yeah, it works yeah. in a slightly different way. I feel that would damn you, I guess. Mm. <laughs> uh, what is? I, I, I want to. I want to underline. What do you see? Mm. A question we've had from book one, uh, that I think gets at that very simple sentence. I think is the core of so much of this series and what it's about. So I, I just wanted to highlight what what do you see? I guess shivers every time I read that. I'm like imagining it mm. in real life. Just wondering what is like not understand complete because even now I don't understand what it means. Like and that's what's the most scary and always like not understanding anything and seeing it happen. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. experiencing it without knowing yeah. who you are, probably. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad not being in that world, but <laughs> yeah. I guess I don't know enough about the metaphysics of this world to guarantee that it's not the same in our, but... I what I can say about another, another, <laughs> uh, another gram, another sprinkling of, of hope and light here in this ending is that the series like to subvert and challenge and critique a lot of classic heroic tropes. But Sirwa, talking about it, she gets the classic heroic moment, and apparently she even survived it. It would have been sufficiently heroic and good and great if she had died killing the dragon like Beowulf, but she apparently lives past that. So that is, I think, a moment of hope that this you know, young woman, this girl, she's a teenager, does this great thing and is given, you know, the, the flaming sword and takes takes the guy, takes the monster down, kills the dragon. Does do that. Skutula, mm -hmm. <laughs> the black vomited hell. I had that highlighted. Skutula. <laughs> Skutula. I don't know, how are you saying the dragon's name? I called him Skutula. Yeah, I guess Not so. <laughs> Not as cool as his demented buddy, the first of the dragons. Oh yeah, <laughs> his, his demented buddy was less of a perv. So oh yes, well L there were there weren't females around him then for him to That's express fair. his True. perversion. <laughs> That's a good point. I I shouldn't put him on a pedestal. He would disappoint <laughs> me. Never meet your heroes, folks. <laughs> what What do you think Kellis meant when he said, "I have mastered temporal power"? Meaning he can see God, everything. Seen across time. Yeah. Uh, yes, that makes sense. And you know, that that was interesting that immediately after that, um, he puts his hand through those the holograms and they go right through. And yeah. Malover B is like supremely confused. And I'm like, he, he said, I've mastered temporal power. So I thought he went into some additional dimension where he can walk through things now. And, and it turned out it was just holograms. So like, that was, that was <laughs> cheap <laughs> compared to what I was starting to imagine. <laughs> There's no limit to what you can do no. in your mind. <laughs> no, I, I was trying to make sense of the mastering temporal power, what that means. and. Yeah, but can you imagine like reading this ending without having our discussions and the first time and you're like, oh, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and without knowing that the appendix is so long, like when you're just reading the first time I remember, I was like, what? This is ended? <laughs> I was like, I went back and forward. I'm like, am I, is my Kindle copy corrupted? Do I need to find a new one? I, I think I would, I would have been frustrated. Uh, I, I think that was me, especially because it almost feels like it ends on a cliffhanger. Um, but then like sitting back on it for a couple of days, I would have been like, okay, that, that was really good. Mm. And then I would have read obsessively about is Baker going to write this no God trilogy <laughs> or duology, whatever it's supposed to be. Yeah. I guess I still had hope when I read it. Mm, how long it was ago a while was ago. It? <laughs> it was a decent while ago, mm. at least 10 years ago, I feel. Has it been 10 wow. years since this I book know. came I, out? I, it's, I think it's been like, when did it come out? I think it's, the yeah, it's it's like, it is like 10 years ago. Unholy Consult. <laughs> Published. When? Um, I think 
Why doesn't it say the publication date? 2017. Ah, trilogy. Seven years ago. Okay. okay. Yeah. I guess I probably read the first trilogy seven years ago, and then the second one I waited until the end. But it's still, That's yeah, awesome. it's still been a while. Seven years. Very good. Okay. What are you know? What are your final thoughts from joining us on this journey, Dan? Yes. Yeah, some of the stuff I didn't think too much about the first time, right? Um, and I didn't explore even in my mind some of the philosophical implications of the characters, and especially like the you know going deep into actually the characters. I was not on my own. It's I didn't go too much into it, a little bit, obviously, but, um, and some of the theories I didn't think at all before, because there's a lot of extra stuff, I guess, and a lot of like, oh, it could be that, it could be that, or I never thought about it, right? Mm. And some of them, it just, yeah, every time you discuss, it's just like you're peeling another layer, and you're like, okay, I see, I see more into this. I understand more and there's like things I never thought about. Yeah. Just like when you're, I'm reading online, I'm always learning new things and it's, yeah, and it's nice to read it with someone. It is. I mean, that, made, that added so much to this experience. I, I'm so yeah. grateful for this. It, it really has been uh, very special. I've it's, never it's... found anyone in real life that read it slash enjoyed it. I think I've talked to a couple of people that read the first book or second book and they're like, I hate this. Yeah. <laughs> Which, again, I think it's completely valid. Yeah. Uh, it's not for everyone. I don't think I've met anyone that actually read it and enjoyed it. It's very niche. It's, it, I would call it at this point, it's like a cult series, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. But I don't see it becoming anything more than that at any point. I, I think it could reach, though, that like Blood Meridian level of like, it has a surprisingly large audience, and but it is still divisive. And but I think you know, what? maybe fancy these days could do it. I think there's a blog post of him saying something like, oh, fancy is the new literature because you can explore things that you cannot explore with. So him trying to give more legitimacy to fancy because right now it's not. Like, it, it, fancy never won a, I don't know, uh, and noble for literature or whatever, right? Well, they do, but they, they just like, they're, they're then called like magical realism. Or, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you're really yeah. talking like the epic fantasies, right? Yeah. Like the, the Lord of the Rings, you know, which is, which is one of the big ones, but even then it's kind of, I think, associated almost as like a, a, a kid story. Yeah. Um, it, like, I don't know if like even sci-fi ever won like noble or literature or any. Ishiguro... Some of his Maybe. books are arguably sci-fi. Definitely never let me go as sci-fi, I would think. Mm, okay. But yeah, I think like fan epic fantasy is not, it's considered a lesser. Lower brow. Oh, no, definitely. Mm. Right. So he's sort of, but some of his back. posts are a bit, when I'm reading them, I don't know. I read a Reddit uh, post about, uh, with a silly cartoon of him talking with, uh, how what was it? He was like talking with some woman at university and the woman was like, oh, what do you do for work? And it's like, oh, I write uh, epic literature or stories in our world. It's like, oh, nice, very nice, kind of condescending. And then he goes back home and writes, oh, you know, epic fantasy is the next level of literature, blah, 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 very salty. It's probably supposed now read a bit like that to me, but I can, you know, I can see where he comes from. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, it is. The, the stigma is real. I mean, just the size of the readership for non-genre fiction is much bigger, I think. Um, like a book uh, that doesn't do well that. is bigger. I don't know. Gets more reviews on Goodreads than like a contemporary fiction. That's just average. I think has a lot more reviews on Goodreads than a very good fantasy book too. Yeah, but like the stuff that literature, I guess, nerds or elitists read, I don't think gets a lot of hmm. it reads, I think. I, I, I think it depends. Like romance books, that is a genre. They're very yeah. much genre fiction, and they are the best-selling books in the world and yes. have been for a long time. 
Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know that I agree with that. I actually think that part of the reason that they feel elitist is because their books don't sell as well. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Um, maybe I meant non-fantasy and mm. sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, romance is definitely big. Maybe I think there are some genres that are just really big, like romance, and I think mystery and thrillers, perhaps, I would imagine. Yeah, definitely. Um, true. Maybe horror, even. No, hor- hor- horror, think so. horror sells even worse than fantasy. Mm. It's, it's seen in a resurgence in the last couple decades, mm. but uh, it's, not, it's not on the same level. Fantasy, I and mean, we have some major bestsellers. Like, that's the thing to consider. A lot of them are like kid stories, but, um, you know, Brandon Sanderson sells like hotcakes. Mm. It's, it really yeah. is like. I mean, Harry Potter, Lord of Rings, yeah. right? Like, all the biggest movie franchises are like fantasy in a sense. That's true. Avatar, the Maybe MCU. Maybe just set, publish your book, but don't call it fantasy. That might get you. Oops. Oh, he's gone. His battery finally he's died. Back. Oh, no, we need to wait for him to, to, uh, uh, yeah. to finish it off. Yes. But I don't think that fancy is... I, yeah, fancy is a lot more mainstream now. It is now. I think maybe the more popular romance fantasy books... I refuse to call it romanticy, but the, maybe those are uh, bringing in more readership to fantasy as a whole. I feel but, like Harry Potter and like the Song of Ice and Fire were the big. Yeah, they are really big. But, of... So where where I'm coming from, like I haven't read any research mm-hmm. on this or anything, but yeah. when I see an like a contemporary fiction book on Amazon that I want to read that I've barely heard about, that's just showing mm-hmm. up on my recommendations, versus a fantasy book that everybody on booktube is talking about the number of ratings for both mm-hmm. like it's orders of magnitude higher for the contemporary mm. fiction book so that's that's why i think contemporary fiction is just generally more popular than fantasy and sci-fi mm. i guess yeah there's probably a way larger audience of just random people that just grab a random book uh and are not like their hobbies not reading it's just you know Mm. And just read a book every once in a while, right? Yeah, yeah. And and they are less likely to pick up fantasy, sci-fi, maybe. I'm guessing. I so think. I didn't... Especially like a seven-book fantasy series or like, yeah. you know, multiple books, something. Instead of one thing that's... That's also a commitment, right? And and also, I guess, the, the word count limit or the average word count yeah. for those books is... A hundred thousand words, but that is a very short fantasy book in most cases. Hey, he's back. Yes. Hey. <laughs> you joined in portrait orientation, apparently, or whatever. Anyway. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah. Riverside... I also feel like people are less into, if you're a fantasy book, then you need to commit yourself to, yeah. you know, learning about this world. If you're really just kind of really, you know the world. Right. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. You, everything is built for you, right? You just need to read the story. Yeah, yeah, I I think so. And also there's just the general derision about fantasy that also plays into it. That Those are kids' stories. I thought you grew yeah. out of that. Yeah. Not... I'm not saying there's anything <laughs> wrong with contemporary fiction or oh, whatever. Oh, no. It just... Not at all. Different audiences. But yeah. I also, I often find myself not realizing, like, how different my bubble is compared to reality. Sure. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, okay. So with that, I guess we will probably get the group back together to definitely talk about atrocity tales mm-hmm. and possibly we will get Steve Swatha's quotes. We have to have yes, Swatha's from quote. the un- yes. and yes, we have to do that when we meet back for atrocity tales. We'll get Steve Swatha's quotes from the last <laughs> part of Unholy Consult. And we might do other follow-up discussions for the appendices and uh, and the theory homework that Dan's going to give us all. <laughs> yeah, I guess I need to make a post uh, on that stuff. Yeah. And uh, I think this group pretty much, and with a few more people we are hoping will join us, are going to get back together for the discussion of the Malazan Book of the Fallen scheduled to start yeah. in 
October. <laughs> Dan's taking a deep breath because he wasn't aware last time we talked about this that uh, we are also going to do the Esselmont books. So <laughs> it's... Yeah, I don't know. I'm skeptical of that, but we'll see. <laughs> We'll see. Goes. We'll like we'll we'll play it by ear. There's like no hard rules there. Uh, I think there might be good books to go back and forth between because they are shorter. Mm. And I uh, I'm given really to understand. Like, yeah, sorry. I like Night of Knives a lot. Um, mm. It was actually the second. Uh, I know a lot of people struggle with that, but that one I really liked, and it is short and it it reads pretty quickly. Um, I'm excited to read the Path to Ascendancy mm. Ascendancy books. I'm I've heard good things mm. about. And that is a key backstory that I am desperate to. Yes. Okay. Same. I'm I'm eager okay. for the key backstory bit too. So and and I and I've heard nothing but good things about the Esselmont books. So they should be fun to interweave together with the books of the fallen and read the whole book. So anyway, that is scheduled to start sometime in October. So if that is something of interest to you, consider checking out the forum. And of course, as always, open invitation to join the actual discussion group. We meet every Tuesday night. And I think that schedule will probably stay for the Malazan Book of the Fallen or Malazan discussions. And yeah, or just come to the forum to talk to us about those books or come help us theorize about the uh, Second Apocalypse series. Um, if, yeah, I guess, oh, I did my spiel before doing the outros. Dan, where can people find you? <laughs> uh, sure, you can find me at Patreon Forum and I guess reading Malazan for the next three years, I think I calculated. There if about. things go well. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> And Carl. Uh, yeah, you can find me around the Patreon forums uh, on social media at Carl D. Albert. Uh, if you want to check out an epic fantasy that is uh, certainly dark, um, but does have moments of, of heart and hope and levity, um, it's inspired, you know, where, where Baker was inspired by biblical epics and the classics, I took a lot of inspiration from uh, Shakespeare and Shakespearean tragedy. Mm. Um, and Oedipus Rex, I would say, in sort of the Greek tragedies. Um, and so that's Truth of Crowns. Um, you can find it online. Um, and otherwise, uh, you know, I'm around. So if you want to flame me for, for my book, you're welcome to do that as well. Yeah. Uh, Give them your address so we can come and talk to you in person. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That, you're right. I mean, I have my physical address. Yeah, yeah you, you guys can come and like light the books on fire in front of, like in my, that'd, that'd be really good. I'm sure it would um, be civil discussion. Yeah, really civil discussion. I love it. Um, no, but uh, please join us on the Patreon forum. It's a lovely community, really. Um, has been a, a real highlight um, in my life since I joined it. Yep. Come check out the Patreon forum to talk about these books or any other books or to come here at Carl about his book. Uh, thank you so much for listening to our discussions at for sticking along with us as we made our way through these books. We had a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed listening to our discussions and thank you for your comments as you left them. Um, yeah, thank you so much all around and hopefully we'll see you during the Malazan discussions starting in about a month. Thank you so much. Bye.